Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's uh, joint CPI and uh, MediLink webinar series. Um, welcome to those who've joined the webinar for the first time, and welcome back to those who joined the initial session on Tuesday. So I'm Dr. Tom Harvey. I work for CPI Electronics. I'm leading CPI's activities on MedTech development, and I'm going to be chairing uh, the two sessions today. So it's great to see so many people um, participating in, in the event today. Um, thank you very much for, for attending. On Tuesday, we hosted the first three sessions of the webinar and um, we already covered the topics of medical needs, information governance and regulation. So um, those are obviously very important topics. And today we're going to cover in this session um, the topic of technology. And then at two o'clock this afternoon, um, we're going to cover uh, services and funding. So um, I invite you to join us for that afternoon session as well. So I'd like to start by saying thank you very much to all the speakers for participating in today's events and passing on the benefits of their experience. Um, that's great. Thank you very much. So just a couple of housekeeping things before we get going on, on the speakers for, uh, for today. Microphones for the audience are going to remain muted throughout the session today. So if you'd like to ask a question, please do that through the question, the Q&A function, which you will see in, in the bottom menu, menu bar, and we'll respond um, two questions at the end of the session. So uh, I will, as chairman, I'll see your questions coming through and I will ask those um, to the speakers. So we'll, we'll take questions at the end and any uh, questions which either the speakers are not available to answer or we don't get to, then we'll try and answer those um, after the webinar to those people have recorded, uh, that, that, that see uh, the recording. Uh, so just uh, finally, yes, the session will be recorded and you'll have access to that recording afterwards. So with, uh, without any further ado, I'd like to get started this morning. So I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who's going to be si Dr. Simon Johnson. Simon is the Chief Technologist um, at CPI Electronics. And in his current role, he acts as a knowledge expert for the printed electronics business, um, supporting strategic and development activities. And he's going to talk to us today about flexible and 3D electronics for connected medical devices. So Simon, if you could unmute microphone and share your screen it's over to you thank you great thanks very much tom i'll uh, make sure i click the right button there we go hopefully you've got a yes that's coming through starting thank slide you, Simon. excellent good okay well well thanks very much for the introduction and, and uh good morning to everybody uh, as tom said i'm going to be giving a, a short presentation this morning uh, focused around really the technology challenge that we, we've come across uh, at CBI in, in medical devices. Um, medical devices is one area that we do get quite a lot of inquiries and, uh, and do a fair bit of work with, in, in, with, with clients. We've come up with some, uh, some interesting uh, devices and products over the last uh, uh, few years and I'm going to go through a few case studies which will explain some of the interesting challenges that we've we've seen over over the time um okay so there's the the introductory slide i won't uh bore you bore you with what goes on at cpi but do feel free to to dig into our website and and, uh, and ask later if if you are interested to find out what we do but uh, essentially we're here as a, a support organization to to help companies understand technologies and, and what can be done with them Okay, so let's kick off with the question, what, what are the technology challenges of medical devices? Um, these are things that we've seen, okay, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but these are the, the, the areas that we've come across with clients <coughs> in discussion and, and developments to, to understand where the, the real key technical challenges are. And one of the biggest ones we, we often find is, is the form factor, what your product design is going to be like. It, in medical devices, it's often very necessary to uh, create very small compact devices, very lightweight, maybe wearable devices. And so those sort of form factors can be quite a challenge for conventional electronics. There often the, a need for these things to be very mobile. So uh, they need a power source that is uh, mobile as well. You can't plug many of these devices in. 
Um, and sometimes they have to do quite a bit of, of uh, electronics calculation, microprocessors running at high speed, communications, and so power, uh, power consumption could be quite a challenge. They also need to be very robust because the environments that these uh, devices are used in can be pretty challenging. Uh, washable uh, devices, for example, things like a wearable shirt that's doing EMG that then has to be washed regularly. Uh, those sort of challenges can be quite, quite uh, serious. Connectivity is a, is a major issue with these, these sort of devices because just as you don't want power to be plugged in, you don't want uh, data connectivity to be plugged in. And so wireless connectivity is, is a fundamental part of these devices most of the time. And so making sure you've got good connection indoors and outdoors, uh, making sure you've got a secure connection that is always going to be there when you need it. Some of these things might be quite critical and, and need to be uh, re reliable and, and, and there when when you, they can be guaranteed to be there, for example. Uh, and also the, the data standards that are used for, for communicating data between different systems um, are, are often quite, uh, quite challenging to, to make sure there's uh, commonality between those. Getting onto more, more sort of soft areas of, of things like uh, ease of use, a uh, fundamental part of a, a good product design is something that is easy to use. And, and often the devices that we're looking at here are quite technical. And so there's a, a, a challenge between making something that is very technical and does a very complex and technical task and making it very simple to use because many of the uh, customers, people who are using these things are not necessarily technically competent. Um, and then we get into very soft areas that are not really so much technology as, as to do with use cases to how these things are used, but how the data is collected um, from, from a user. Um, we have a pill pack, for example, which we'll come on to later that, that stores uh, when pills were taken. How do we get that data back from the user uh, and guarantee that we get it in, in the right time and, and in the right way? Um, and uh, how do we make these devices as inconspicuous and obtrusive as possible. We don't want them interfering with people's daily life because that affects the last point that I've got here, which is adoption. Because if they are a pain to use and a nuisance, they won't get used. And, and that can seriously compromise the, the benefits that can be gained from these things. And the adoption is important, not just for consumers, but for professionals, finding that they are beneficial and, and easy to use, uh, and manufacturers getting some benefit from these things. That, that, that's a, a very quick summary of some of the challenges that we found over the, over the years in, in working in medical devices. And one of the approaches that we've taken to solving some of those is to use um, uh, non-conventional electronics forms. The slide here shows a set of uh, PCBs. Everything that you have that is electronics pretty much is made on a printed circuit board. It's a rigid piece of epoxy with layers of, of conductors in it and a whole set of rigid components uh, soldered onto the top of it and, well, maybe both sides very commonly. This technology is fantastic. I mean, it's been around 50, 60, 70 years um, and has been evolved to a point where it's incredibly cheap, uh, incredibly technically competent. It can do all sorts of very sophisticated things and allow us to connect up very complex systems. But one of its fundamental challenges is that PCBs are, are rigid pieces of, of epoxy. Um, they're not the lightest of things, they can be quite, quite heavyweight, um, and they always require some sort of interconnection. Most of these things require quite complex connectivity, um, but fundamentally they're rigid bits of epoxy. That, that don't necessarily conform to being worn on the shirt uh, around a, maybe a throat if you've got a dressing or something like this. Um, they're not comfortable. So one of the approaches we take at CPI is to make use of alternative forms of assembly and manufacture for electronics devices. And um, this slide here illustrates some of the approaches that we take. Fundamentally, we, we do a lot of bendable, flexible electronics. So instead of using a rigid uh, printed circuit board as the substrate to build your, your circuit on, we use a, a flexible piece of film, maybe a, a 35 micron thick PET, uh, something like that, incredibly thin and flexible that can easily conform to curved surfaces. Um, we could even make use of, of stretchable materials like TPUs and so on, uh, or fabrics even, and build circuits on those. So we can eliminate this rigid PCB, which frees up a lot of uh, constraints in the design of, of products. Uh, we can also build electronics into product parts. So actually embedding components into plastic parts or building them on a surface that can be formed uh, into 2D, 2.5D or, or 3D shapes. All of these approaches mean that we are no longer constrained by the form factor of a conventional PCB. 
and that does have a massive impact on the usability and, and many of the challenges that I, I mentioned earlier. So this approach we call flexible and structural electronics, and I will just very quickly explain a little bit more about that. So the flexible structural makes a combination, or it's a combination of two electronics technologies. We use additive technologies, as they're called, uh, printing essentially, to, to bring together conventional electronic components and these printed uh, el electronic systems on flexible, stretchable, or 3D surfaces. And this approach has, has the benefit of bringing together these two uh, technologies. So we've got the, the massive uh, investment in conventional components that gives us incredibly powerful little microprocessors in, in little one millimeter square bits of silicon. Um, remarkably low cost, remarkably powerful that can do all sorts of measurements and data transmission and, and the like. But we combine that with these, these flexible substrates and flexible sensing in, in, indeed in various other forms of, of different sorts of components and circuits. And by combining those two, you really get the best of both worlds. You get a free form factor that allows you to create products that can be easily uh, adapted to very small medical devices or wearable devices, that type of thing. But you've got the benefit of the, uh, the, the, the evolution of electronics over the last uh, 60 years or so. And on the right there, you see a couple of examples. We'll, we'll, we'll see these frequently throughout the, the presentation. Things like smart dressing on the bottom right there, uh, a, a crash helmet that's got sensing uh, built into it and uh, uh, at the top middle. And then on the, the center left, we've got a, a smart pill pack, which can, can log when, when things are taken. We also do all sorts of other projects, such as extremely stylish jeans that fortunately I didn't have to wear, even though we, we helped to make them. So this is a list of some examples of um, medical and healthcare devices that we've been involved with in various ways over the last uh, few years. Uh, and you can see it's quite an exhaustive list. There, there are lots of, lots of different types of device that, that these sorts of electronic uh, technologies can help to develop. So things like simple temperature measurement, blood oximetry, little wearable devices for these sort of things, heart rate, uh, various forms of electro uh, cardiogram, myography, that type of thing. Um, one of the, the, well, the biggest uh, printed electronics device is the glucose sensor. That is a device that's made using printed electronics technologies and techniques. Uh, and there are uh, many, many, many millions of those made every, every year. Um, but then we can do things like breath analysis, breathing rate, um, step and, and, and gait of, of, uh, of people as they're walking around, trying to work out, make sure they're, they're, they're um, joints are working properly, this type of thing, uh, right the way down to sort of trauma and, and wound monitoring, which can be done using these techniques. So we can make a smart dressing that can go around and, and monitor what's going on inside the dressing. So that it doesn't have to be removed to check that it's still okay in there and then put back on the, 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 the smart dressing can do the, the monitoring itself. So all of these technologies have sort of enabled this type of, uh, uh, this breadth really of different types of device. Just to give an idea of the, the, a bit more detail on that, some of the types of sensing that we can produce as well. So I mentioned that we um, we combine conventional components, uh, which might be things like microprocessors, but there might be sensor integrated circuits, so integrated circuits that can sense, say, accelerometers and, and uh, uh, things like temperature and humidity. But also we can print the sensors for those sorts of devices. And so the... Um, list here shows some of the types of devices that can be printed. So temperature, uh, we can actually print a temperature sensor. Uh, it looks like a little little black blob and actually there isn't one on this particular uh, slide. Uh, over on the right here we've got uh, pressure sensors, here we've got strain gauges. This is uh, um, of course a, a glucose uh, strip. Um, uh, this is a form of ten temperature sensor in the middle here. Um, in fact that one is a, a temperature and a hum humidity sensor in the center there. Um, so all forms of various forms of sensing device can be printed as well as uh, making use of conventional components. Nice thing is that we end up with uh, very thin, conformable, lightweight uh, systems that uh, are very uh, convenient to wear, but also convenient to build into other products. Just a little bit more about the technology. There's essentially two types of technology that I'm going to be covering in, in or illustrating in this, this presentation. Uh, the first is film or paper-based uh, electronics. And, and here what we do is that we 
build the circuit conducting layers onto a film. Uh, we normally do that with conventional additive printing techniques. So things like screen printing that might be used, say, to produce a, um, a T-shirt, uh, that type of printing process, or flexographic or other forms of rotary printing that are used in, 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 in industry to make magazines or all sorts of things like that. Those sorts of conventional printing processes can be used with conducting inks. So the exa examples on the right here you see, uh, these are all silver printed circuits. So it's a, an ink that contains silver flake. Um, and when it dries, it gives you a, a conducting film that is patterned to exactly the circuit that you need. We do this on uh, very thin substrates, uh, anything down to a few tens of microns thick, typically maybe 100 microns thick for something like a PET film, which is the, the most common thing that we use. But as I mentioned earlier, we can build circuits on things like stretchable substrates like TPUs, which are essentially a sort of a rubber type material. Um, and also some fabrics can be used and it is possible to create circuits directly onto fabrics uh, and even to attach components directly to those, those fabrics, um, which of course introduces lots of challenges in terms of robustness and washability and these sort of things. The components are then added onto this substrate um, using novel conducting adhesives. We don't use solders. Um, the, the solder temperature uh, range is much too high for the, the substrates, the materials that we're working with. So we use conducting adhesives for that, which uh, which are, are really very impressive. You can, can do some very interesting. Um, uh, there's a novel approach called anisotropic conducting adhesive, which allows conduction through a plane in one direction, in the z direction only, and you don't get conduction x and y. Very clever idea, but it means that the assembly of these things uh, can be uh, simplified because uh, of that sort of device and material rather. And then finally, once we built the circuit on this flex, um, we, we can uh, encapsulate it in some way. Generally, these things need to be encapsulated. You need to protect the circuits, uh, maybe protect them from the environment or protect them from users or just hide them from users. And things like laminating into a label uh, is one, one possibility. This, this um, top center uh, illustration here is a smart label. It's about 0.7 millimeters thick in total, contains a battery, a microprocessor, temperature sensor, memory uh, devices, and it can record the, the, the temperature profile that this label sees. And that label probably would be attached to some medicines during distribution so that you know that when the medicines arrive at the uh, the user, they've been within temperature range that, they, that was expected. And, and there's other forms of sensing that we could include in that as well. Oh, this one down here, by the way, the, the bottom right image, uh, the little circle there, that's a printed temperature sensor uh, alongside the rest of the circuitry, alongside a couple of microchips that are doing the, the data recording. This is an accelerometer, a tiny little chip uh, that, that can measure shock. So if you drop the, uh, the package that contains the medicines, that, that can be recorded as well. So it's possible to build these uh, very complex systems up on, onto, onto these flex circuits uh, and, and make a, a, a complete data logging system in a, a little paper label uh, or flexible rather uh, label uh, of less than a millimeter thick. The other approach that's very relevant for these sorts of devices, medical devices, is what's called in mold electronics or sometimes 3D circuits. And this approach um, gets rid of the flex substrate and replaces it with the product part that you're going to build your component with. So you might be doing something like a, an inhaler, uh, plastic uh, molds for, for, for an inhaler product or something like that. And you want to count the number of um, uh, uses of the inhaler. Well, the electronics to do that could actually be built within the, the, the electronics part, sorry, the plastic part that you're building using these in-mold electronics techniques. Uh, the approach is really that there are various approaches that we use, but on the right here, we see a couple of different alternatives. Essentially, we can build the circuit directly onto a non-planar or non-flat surface, a 3D part. So these illustrations here show um, ready form parts that are then uh, coated and, and um, we're, we're printing directly these silver tracks or copper circuits, or in this case, gold flashed circuits. Um, directly onto the 3D surface. The approach that's used for that, there's various approaches that, that can be used. One approach is to use uh, aerosol jet printing. So this illustration at the bottom here has a, uh, 
rather like an inkjet printer, but it, it produces a very fine jet of, um, uh, of ink that is sprayed at very high resolution down to a few tens of microns to create extremely fine patterns. But that is done over, over a 3D surface. And you can see tracks here that are running along the, the lower surface, up a wall, and then over on the top surface. Um, so we can print over this, this 3D surface and then the components can be added uh, subsequently. These other uh, examples in the center here are using a, an approach called laser direct structuring, where we use a laser to, to write the pattern of the conductors directly onto the surface of a sensitized plastic. So it's a plastic that when exposed to the laser then becomes susceptible to plating and we can, we can add um, a copper or, or other, other conducting material uh, using a plating process. Um, these are commercial, process, commercial processes used for um, quite a number of devices. The famous one is that in both, for both of these technologies is that the antennas on, on some mobile phones are created using this on the plastic inner surface of the, your, your mobile phone directly onto the, the plastic part itself. So they're, they're clever techniques, but it does mean that you can uh, create your plastic part and then build your circuit directly onto it, eliminating the need for, for printed circuit boards. The sort of challenge that this could help to overcome is, is removing connectivity. If you don't have to mount a printed circuit board inside a, a, your, your product and then connect to it, you're removing a number of connectors and connectors are, are the fundamental challenge in, in all electronic devices in terms of reliability and robustness. So if we can just integrate everything into one, one solid part, that's a great benefit to the, the robustness of devices, for example. The top illustration here shows it's quite a difficult picture to see, but this is actually a piece of polycarbonate film uh, sheet, something like a millimeter thick. We've printed a circuit onto there uh, when it's in, in its flat form and then added components. And so we end up with a working printed electronic circuit with things like LEDs and microprocessors attached on, on the, the top surface here. And then the, the part is put into a thermoforming or vacuum forming uh, uh, machine that, that forms in, into a 2.5D or, or 3D part. Um, and so again, we end up with a surface that has the electronics directly built onto it uh, and no need to have a separate printed circuit board. How are we doing for time? Need to, need to move on a bit. Um, okay, so, so basically flexible form factor is, is really what these technologies provide. Um, and uh, there's some, some further examples of the, the type of devices that, uh, that we, we, we've built. So I'm going to run through um, some examples now uh, in the last five minutes. Uh, I hope that's okay, Tom, in terms of timing. Um, the first illustration here is a, a smart pill pack. Um, this is all about medical adherence and making sure that, that patients take the, the medicines when they should uh, and, and that the, the, the clinicians have some record of, of what's been done. This is a smart pill pack here, as you can see. Um, you can actually see some printed tracks here. And it's pretty obvious what happens when you push a pill through the, the film, that breaks the track and the electronics, which is hidden underneath this, uh, this left-hand end of the, the pill, pill pack, uh, records what's going on. It records when the pill was taken and it stores that in, in the, the pill pack. There's no need for the user to do anything. So one of those sort of unobtrusive, quiet, get on with the work in the back ground sort of approaches. Uh, the user doesn't have to worry what's going on or doesn't even know necessarily. Um, but the electronics that's built into here, there's a, a printed battery, there's a microprocessor and some storage. Every time a pill is popped through, um, that is recorded. And then when the pill is the, the pill pack is finished, the user may at that point um, uh, use a mobile phone to get the data and send that automatically to, to their doctor. Um, or they may simply return the pack to the doctor um, through through normal sort of routes for, for that type of thing so that the data is 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 returned is recorded. Um, this, you know, the, the benefits of this are, are immense in, in some circumstances. And we've had many approaches and many discussions with clients about the, the, the use of flexible electronics for this type of uh, function, really extremely effective. This is a, a second example that shows a different type of device. Here we're, we're creating a smart helmet or we've been working with a company called HP1 Technologies uh, to do this. This is to create a, a pressure sensor array on the inside surface of a crash helmet. So that if there is, um, uh, you have an accident, you fall off your bike and, and crack your head on the, the road, um, 
the impact, uh, the trauma is recorded by uh, by this helmet. And um, the 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 idea of this actually came from a chap within the company who who had a, a cycle accident, quite a severe impact to his head, um, and realised that it would be useful to the clinicians to know more about what had happened to him. So came up with this idea and this is using printing technologies here so all of these are this is an array of printed sensors and you can see a, a different pattern on the inside here something like 200 or over 200 sensors on this this inner surface here um, about 64 on this one and connected into a conventional bit of electronics uh, that um, allows the um, the, the, the doctors at the, in this case at the end of uh, uh, end, end use sort of point to extract the data and say okay this is where this is where the, the impact happened and it was a pretty serious one we know exactly what force was involved and the duration and, and, and that sort of thing there's a lot of data that they can then say right we need we know where we can focus our, our attention on looking at what might have gone wrong here. A uh, very clever approach and a very smart idea and again robustness is enhanced by this sort of technology if you had to connect up 64 different uh, uh, pressure sensors on the inside of a helmet, the wiring would be absurd. Uh, so you know, th this type of approach, a monolithic approach, if you like, to creating these sensor, sensor arrays is, uh, is very effective. And this, um, this will show uh, if the video works. Uh, okay. Video is not going to work for some reason, but uh, this shows a crash, uh, a cricket helmet in this case uh, being impacted, and this is the the pressure sensor sort of pattern that's been interpolated from the the sensor array. Um, and then the the third example is uh, a smart label. Um, this is a, a device that we've done multiple uh, sort of uh, different implementations of. Um, it's a device that can log temperature or shock or humidity or a, a new variant that we're looking at doing now it can can also record light exposure so that while medicines are being shipped from uh, the pharmacy to the end user or, or from the drugs manufacturer to the end user um, the data is recorded and the idea which is uh, sort of summarized here is that we're trying to sense in this case it was uh, temperature and humidity wanted to log data for a period of up to a month. We know that these things in fact can go for, for longer than that. And you're probably wanting to record temperature maybe once every 15 minutes or something like that. Um, want to make it very simple to use. And, and in this case, we made use of uh, NFC and mobile phones to extract the data. So at any point along the supply chain from the, the pharmacy through to the end user, someone with an appropriate app on a phone could tap on the label. Sorry, here's, here's one that I, is sort of an example of the type of thing that um, we, we've built with these. Um, you, you simply tap your phone on there and you can find out what the temperature history of that device has been or, or other sensing. And you see the app displayed uh, below here. I'm not going to go into any detail here, but I just want to illustrate that these are sophisticated devices. This is a complete microprocessor system. Okay, It's an ARM microprocessor core. Uh, it's got a power management, it's got a, an array of sensors, it's got uh, local data storage and power management and the microprocessor that can do very sophisticated edge processing as it's called. So these things can be very sophisticated and complex. And this is uh, finally an illustration of uh, some, some data on uh, shipping of <clears throat> some packs over to Stockholm. In, in this case, we also did the same one over to, um, to Australia uh, and get a very good record of what's going on in terms of temperature. But it could have been a, a whole range of different parameters that, that was being recorded and, you know, proves the verif proves the veracity of the, the drugs once they get to the, the final location, they're still safe to use. And the things like clinical trials, it proves that they are still within spec and, and uh, therefore should be should be doing what they're supposed to do. OK, that's a very short run through and I'm sorry if I've ever run a few minutes, Tom, but I, I hope, hope that's given you a bit of an idea of some of the challenges that there are with technical uh, issues with tech, with medical devices um, and some approaches that might help to alleviate some of those. OK, thanks very much, Tom. Thank you very much um, for that presentation um simon um, i'll stop sharing now shall i yep thank you very much 
So um, yes, thank you very much, that Simon. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, please, if you have any questions for Simon, please put those into the Q and A, and um, we'll try and take those at the end. Um, so. Um, uh, Simon's sort of very enthusiastic about the subject you see, he's run over a little bit, but I um, uh, hope we can get back on time later. Uh, so I'd like to move straight away to introduce our next speaker, please. So um, can I introduce Tony Bedford? Um, Tony is a director for front-end innovation at Philips Medisize, um, and he's been involved in the development of medical devices for 25 years. So uh, Tony's well qualified um, to talk on this topic today, and he's going to talk to us about connected drug delivery, um, including the value of digital digitizing medication. So over to you, Tony, uh, please unmute and um, let's have a look at your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, hopefully you can. OK, you actually just muted me there, Tom. So we're uh, playing a little bit of speaker speaker tag. Um, hopefully you can hear me now. Um, I'm assuming that as no one's flagged. Yes, we can hear you now, Tony. Good. We just can't Thanks. see your slides yet, so please share. Your ah, they're coming through yeah. now. Yeah, do that. Brilliant. That's okay. perfect. Thank you. Splendid. Okay. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Um, just very quickly, as, as we have already overrun a little bit, I'll try and avoid uh, taking too much or too much time over what I've been allocated already. So just a, a few words about me and a few words about um, Philips Medicize, if I may. So. Uh, if you haven't come across us before, we are best known as a global manufacturer of, of medical devices, a lot of which is in the drug delivery space and actually making products on behalf of other pharma or device companies. So you're less likely to see something that is Philips Medicize branded, or at least until recently, you're, you're less likely to see that. So we have no connection with the other Philips, um, which pretty much everybody will have, have heard of, of course. Um, so we also have an innovation arm of which I'm part. So as, as Tom said is in, in his introduction, uh, my background is, is product design. I've been involved in product design of medical devices for, uh, yeah, I'm afraid to say 25 years. Um, it feels like a frighteningly long time, uh, mostly based down in the Cambridge region, which uh, some of you I'm sure will be aware is a, a little bit of a hub for that sort of activity, but not exclusively so. So I belong to the front end of innovation group within Philips Medicize. Um, we are responsible for, as, as it kind of states in the title, I suppose, so front end activities. So looking at, at strategies for our clients, but also we are slowly growing a portfolio of our own devices for license or sale. And you'll see a little bit of that. This is not intended to be salesy at all. And I apologize if anything comes across it is, but it's not supposed to be, but it, this is more of a kind of indication of what's going on in the market. So we heard a little bit already actually from Simon's talk about drug delivery. And hopefully if my slides will advance, uh, I'll be able to say a little bit more about adherence if you like. But it, it's quite surprising to me that given the cost of developing new drugs and the controls that are in place to ensure what is developed and manufactured is, is, is safe and effective in use. Uh, actually, I spent two years in the clinical research environment, so that's that's quite interesting to me to, to say that. We actually don't give that much attention to what happens outside the clinic, um, particularly around medication non-adherence. This is a really tricky problem with a lot of different contributing factors. It's actually very difficult to gather data reliably that might allow us to better understand its cause, find ways to better support patients. We heard a little bit of that actually, or saw some clues to that in Simon's talk too, and those involved in their treatment. But we do know that the impact of non-adherence is felt right across the healthcare sector. It reduces pharma companies' revenues, adds to healthcare costs, we'll see these in a couple of slides time, and can impact the quality of life of patients. And at the end of the day, that's, that's kind of why we're here. So, these two rather alarming charts, in fact, show on the left the percentage rates of adherence within a number of, of selected conditions, mostly, as you can see, ranging between about half and just less than two thirds of patients. And that's in the diabetes space, that bottom one there, actually taking their medication. So even for very serious long term conditions, drop off can um, 
typically occur after, occur after just three months of beginning to take those medications, which is really quite a frightening thing. So keeping patients on their meds as long as we possibly can, helping them to ensure that they stay on their meds for all time if necessary is, is a really important thing. Now to the right, the data again from 2015, so don't have up to date position of this, but I suspect it hasn't changed very much, shows the cost per patient of non-adherence for some selected conditions. Across all conditions, this ranges from a staggering $13,000 up to $26,000. And those costs are made up of pharmacy costs, uh, inpatient costs, outpatient costs, ED, emergency department visits, you know, general medical costs and, and hospitalization costs. So there's a huge burden just on the healthcare providers themselves. So those costs that we saw on the previous slide, of course, they all relate to, as I say, the provision of healthcare. But in addition to that, there is a significant loss of revenue uh, from discontinued or even unclaimed prescriptions. We like to call it as money being left on the table um, on the part of the pharmaceutical companies because they simply don't know if their drugs are actually being prescribed and, and therefore used. But of course, right in the middle of this screen, you can see here uh, the impact, the, the physiological impact being borne by patients themselves. So ultimately, um, worse outcomes and of course, increased mortality, which, which none of us want. But what are the causes of non-adherence? So there is a, a fairly persistent but incorrect view that non-adherence is in fact just down to a lack of reminders. Oh, I forgot to take my medication. Oh, well, I'll, never mind. I'll take it next week or, or maybe just not bother at all. But there's increasing data to show that there are actually many factors that contribute to this. And you can see these on the, on the right hand side of, of the screen. So a lack of understanding that might be educational level, maybe poor communication from the healthcare provider that is providing the treatment, the inability to pay, huge issue in the US, of course. Um, the severity of the condition, I'm not going to get better, so why should I bother? Uh, you know, lack of any obvious improvement for those that have been taking medication for a period of time uh, or different medications as well. So a lot of these things can actually be improved with a greater degree of touch point with the patient. But if parents don't show up, if patients don't show up for their appointments or healthcare professionals don't know that non-adherence is an issue, then it's very difficult to kind of follow through with that. So what can we do to help to improve this? Well, for a start, there are already a number of patient support programs in place um, for certain drug products. But as I just said, these do rely on communication between the patient and the healthcare provider. So this chart on the left demonstrates um, the impact of a patient support program, a PSP, on users of Humira, which is, of course, or has been the top selling drug in the US for a period of time. Um, it's for a range of autoimmune diseases, rheumatoid arthritis is, is perhaps its most common um, usage. So although you can see that the drop off rates, the lines on that graph are actually quite close together. When you consider the number of patients involved, it becomes quite clear that there's a huge number of patients here whose, whose outcomes we can actually improve quite significantly through using patient support programs. And then to the right, we can see the financial impact of this. And in particular, that the medical costs involved are dropping quite drastically. So again, it's a really important thing to try and get a grasp on. So over the past few years, we've seen digital technologies. We've seen some already in, in Simon's excellent talk just a few moments ago. Um, we've seen these technologies developing within the healthcare industry although it's still not particularly joined up, particularly in the sense that it can be local or it can be regional with, again, focusing on the US, things like proprietary electronic medical records, electronic prescriptions, and electronic transfer of, of diagnostic data. Once you get beyond that regional setting, it can be a little bit difficult to transfer data from one to the other. But right now, medication is only linked into the electronic systems that we have via clinical consultations that's manual input effectively, and through approaches such as looking at prescription coverage as well. But we are beginning to see a small number of medications just being brought into this digital landscape through the use of connected drug delivery devices capable of detecting and communicating that a dose has been administered. And this is a big step in the direction that we want to be moving in. 
So just a quick slide on, this is a snapshot. Um, I know that one of my uh, friends throughout the industry is, is watching this talk and he will probably spot that his product isn't on there. Apologies, wasn't deliberate. But we've seen a few connected drug delivery device approvals coming through and right across the board in terms of um, routes of administration, if you like. So top left, we can see a subcutaneous delivery or parenteral delivery. Top right, we can see an inhaler and bottom, bottom right as well. Um, and then bottom left, a really interesting technology, actually, which is a, a sensor enabled tablet, if you like. So um, it's uh, the Abilify MySight, which comes with a body worn sensor that can detect whether the patient um, has actually taken that particular pill at a given time. Uh, I won't dwell on these. They're, they're just some, some quick examples. But if we're trying to create a system that provides the benefits of having connectivity, we need to build a kind of digital architecture, if you like, or a digital health architecture. Um, we believe it has three main pillars, and I think most of our, our, our peers throughout the industry who are all also working on this would agree with that. So first of all, you have the connected device where you know that device could be an inhaler, it could be a parenteral or a subcutaneous uh, injection device. They all fit over on this side. So these are the patient interactive type products. This could also in, incorporate other devices, spirometers potentially for measuring lung flow function, that sort of thing. So additional diagnostic and evaluation data that can be fed into the system. Then on the right hand side of the screen, uh, you can see the cloud platform, which is where all that healthcare information is being managed for patients. Any system that we have of this nature must meet stringent regulatory standards. Um, we must ensure data security and integrity. Uh, and we must be able to gain analytics, if you like, to break down that data and, and use it usefully, if you like. And then finally, you've got the middle section on screen there, which provides the digital interfaces for patients and clinicians to uh, either engage with the digital service or indeed engage with one another via a patient support programme or possibly even in, in mainstream healthcare as well. So this layer will hold, for example, commercial dashboards that might allow pharmaceutical companies to assess um, or monitor the launch of their drug products and the effectiveness of the services and the, and the solutions that they're developing as well. Um, these can be app, these can be PC based as you can, you can see kind of implied from the screen. So an example of that, if I just dwell on this one very briefly, this is the Bayer Beta Connect for multiple sclerosis patients. This is a product that, that we developed on behalf of Bayer. Um, and this sort of just shows you briefly what those three pillars are. So again, you can see the device and you can see the relationship or the connections between it and the interfaces and the cloud. And, and again, I think most would agree that this is a, a sort of basis of the format that will work for the industry. So right now, in, in, in my world anyway, it, it feels as though connected drug delivery devices um, are a market that are about to expand exponen exponentially. But there are some things that need to happen in order for that to uh, you know, sort of come true, if you like. I think we and another, a number of other companies out there are developing device solutions that can be uh, retrospectively fitted onto existing devices, we would call those add-ons, which you can see on the, on the left-hand side of the screen. I've used, again, parenteral type devices here, uh, but this could be you know, perfectly suited to respiratory devices. So you can have add-ons for those too. So a, a kind of like a jacket, if you like, that sits around the device um, that is able to sense a dose being administered. Um, or we can have add-in or integrated. So these could be brand new devices designed with connectivity in mind. Uh, or they could be existing devices that we have customized to add some form of connectivity on board. And again, if I refer back to Simon's talk, the use of flexible printed uh, electronics allows us to really optimize and place things into really, really small spaces. Bear in mind that these devices are incredibly well engineered and often very tight on, on space as well. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got uh, a, a newer breed, I suppose, that's coming through, particularly in in the parental space of reusable devices, which um, have a completely different kind of cost profile, if you like. In fact, all three of these have different usage and cost profiles. And it's actually the drive to reduce the cost delta for adding connectivity 
that I suspect is attracting the most effort that, at the moment. We're certainly hearing loud and clear from the pharmaceutical industry that they want connectivity, but as inexpensively as possible to make that business case stack up. Um, and perhaps a close second to the cost element is usability. And again, in, in, in Simon's talk a moment ago, we heard a, a little a couple of clues about um, placing burdens on the patient. If there is additional burden on the patient, there's a high risk that they simply won't do it if they have to pair a device, for example, or they have to interact with an app particularly, it does make it harder and harder for, for us to be able to see that business case succeeding, um, which it has to, you know, particularly in a market where we've seen already from an earlier slide, adherence can be as, as low as 50%. So again, I won't dwell on, on this slide, quick check for time. Um, I won't dwell on this slide, as I say, but just a, a quick look at the sort of data that you might expect to see on the various interfaces. And then there'll be no surprises here, I suspect. Uh, I'm sure we all use our health apps on our smartphones regularly just to check that we've done our 10,000 steps today or the heart rate's fine, sleep pattern's all right. Um, maybe we don't. But a connected drug delivery device app needs to contain all of that data you would expect to see as a patient. It could be reminders. We've said reminders is, is not the be all and end all, but you know that's a big part of that. But historical data, and there will be some treatment specific data that patients may want to see as well. So let's translate that into the interests of the healthcare professional. Uh, groupings by patient cohort, for example, are visible. It makes it easy for the, the HCP to pick out which particular patient or patients they might want to provide additional support or interventions to, for example. So you can filter very quickly who you need to see. And then finally, there's the interest of the pharmaceutical companies who may wish to track usage. Um, and in time, outcomes, you know, at the end of the day, better outcomes is, is what we're all striving for here, I think. But it's not easy. Implementing connectivity does come with some challenges. The, the, the technical challenges I won't dwell on so much here. Um, it's not so easy to design a, a piece of componentry that will interact, particularly with an existing device. The retrospective fit in some ways can be much more challenging than designing a, a new device. Um, so there are some hurdles, you know, this is a, a really, really exciting period, I think, for connected drug delivery. But, you know, to get there, we need to, as I say, well, I've already, we, we need to consider the additional cost, if you like, or the cost per device, or maybe think of it as the cost per injection. And it's unclear if that will actually ever be reimbursed. So this is a cost, the additional cost of the technology that could be borne by the pharmaceutical tech, by the pharmaceutical companies. So they're already paying for their devices. How much more will they withstand paying for devices that are connected if the value that comes back to the pharmaceutical company is very, very difficult to quantify? Um, so the decision to invest and launch in these sorts of things does require pretty careful evaluation of the benefits and the support that needs to be put in place to achieve it. It's also uncharted territory for the regulators uh, and with a myriad of data breaches in the past, not just in, in medical devices, I'm forever receiving emails saying you need to change your password and hacking attempts, you know, perhaps the most famous of whom I suppose in the healthcare environment would be the risk uh, to Dick Cheney's uh, pacemaker a few years ago when he was uh, vice president. Um, so there's huge sensitivity, of course, with, with new regulations just around privacy and data collection too, and the sharing of that data. So perhaps for drug delivery, the risk of a hacker taking charge of a device is low, but those privacy laws and being able to uh, establish data and linking it to a particular patient, that is a little bit more of a challenge, I think. And then finally, so there's that challenge, as I say, around the usability of the device, the patient burden, as I already mentioned, um, has got, really got to be avoided. We've got to make sure that the patient is not only motivated to use the drug, but motivated to do a particular thing if there is a small amount of burden that's required for connectivity. If they have to manipulate something, let's say a single shot disposable device, there's a high chance they're not going to bother. Take the shot throw the thing in the, in the clinical waste bin or in the sharps bin, whatever it might be, and it's done. So of course, then that whole investment has gone to waste and we're right back where we started with slide two. Have we got a non-adherence issue or not? We simply don't know. So 
my final slide then, I, I'd just like to summarise by proposing that there is a hierarchy of opportunity for digital health to assist in disease and medication management, focusing on measurement of both adherence and clinical outcomes. I think that's the most logical target for us to, uh, to head for, I suppose. So at the lowest level of the hierarchy is the ability to actually measure the medication use. Um, and we can do that using connected devices. We can do that reliably. Um, something that's already included, as I say, in some devices on the market, and we're going to see more and more come to the fore. So as we've already said, that, in that information can then be used to support other interventions, such as the use of patient support programmes. And again, these are already in place as a telephone based system, um, but without that link back to the patient and their device. It can allow clinicians to provide timely support and valuable support to their patients. If we can do that in as close to real time as possible, then we can prevent exacerbations, for example, which is a really good thing to be able to do. So that information can even be provided back to the, the patient via an app. So do we actually need to have telephone calls? Do we need to follow through in that way? But anything that we can do that can allow patients to self-support better is going to be a good thing. We've seen the rising costs, uh, not only from non-adherence, but in the healthcare industry as a whole too. So moving a little bit further up the hierarchy, we can then start to focus on disease management by combining medication with other information around outcomes. So for example, in respiratory disease, as I said, the use of spirometry might be able to make a, a, a better assessment of how the, the the, how the disease is actually developing in a particular patient, um, and also how that disease is responding to the treatment that is being given. And again, warn if there's a likelihood or an increased likelihood of exacerbation. So again, you can see how this is all building towards better outcomes for the patient. Um, so these levels, you know, we're seeing these in action today already with some of the connected devices that we've got. And as time goes on, I think we'll see more penetration into the higher levels that you can see there of, of the hierarchy. So ultimately, you know, one would hope that this will allow us to get to the point of personalized healthcare, where we can actually design medication and disease management on an individual basis. That just a couple of years ago seemed like a very long way away beginning to look a little bit more realistic now and that the good work that's going on in personalized diagnostics as well or companion diagnostics will link very nicely I think in, into uh, connected devices too. Um, is this big brother or is this vastly better healthcare? Either way I think it's going to be an exciting journey. That's it from me. Thank you very much um, for that, Tony. Um, some very insightful comments, I think, about about the system. Um, we've had a, a few questions coming in um, during the session, and um, will you be able to stay with us until the end to answer a few questions at the end, Tony? Yes, I can. That's great. So if everyone would like to, if you've got any more questions uh, for Tony about his talk um, or about the topic of connected medical uh, adherence, for example, then please to put those in questions and answers and we'll get to them shortly. So I'd like to move on. Um, thank you very much, Tony. Um, and I'd like to invite the next speaker who's going to be uh, David Fell. Um, from Kaber and Solutions. So uh, David is the uh, product and project director at Kaber and he's a highly experienced mobile telecoms professional. Um, so he's going to talk to us today about the benefits of multi-network connectivity. Um, so this is about using GSM to connect um, devices together. Um, so have we got uh, David online? Hi, Tom. I think that David's just dropped out. So maybe if we um, take some of the questions and I'll try and get David back. OK, uh, no problem. So I've got um, if, if I could just um, ask the two speakers uh, so far, Tony uh, and Simon. Um, so I had uh, a question for for you, Simon, first of all, if you're if you're there and um, if we can unmute uh, Simon. Um, Simon, given that uh, you, you demonstrated some, some great, incredible developments in wearable technology, how come we're not seeing um, a mainstream adoption of wearables for, 
for medical health monitoring at present time? I think it's starting to evolve. Um, it, it, it isn't there yet, but there's uh, a growing uh, number of companies who are making um, devices for things like smart sportswear, for example. Um, that, that's a, a market that's easier to get into. I mean, clearly medical devices are, are difficult in terms of, uh, as, as you covered in the, the talks on Tuesday, in terms of regulation and so on. So that, that can be quite a, a, a hurdle to overcome. But there are companies starting to do it. I mean, um, I think it is an evolving technology is probably the answer. Yeah. Don't see why it won't come, but it, there are some devices around, certainly as uh, things like temperature trackers that can be worn um, and uh, re record, uh, thanks, and, and record um, temperature over, over time, things like for, for children and so on. So there are devices around. It's just uh, a, a new market really, I think. Okay, thank you, Simon. So I have another question for, for Tony. Um, Tony, um, the question was, uh, you mentioned about um, pharma companies and who, who pays um, for the, inf the connected device and the information. Um, so the questioner is asking, um, could the pharma companies use the information gathered from connected devices for demand signals and the like in the supply network? The quick answer is, is yes. Um, the longer answer is not yet, simply because of, of the volumes of data. But if we look at, so the example that I talked a little bit more about was the Bayer Beta Connect for multiple sclerosis. Uh, I mean, that, that's been a, a hugely exciting project for us internally at Phillips Medicines, as I say, because we developed it. But across the industry, perhaps, less exciting only because of the numbers involved so this this does not this does not go out to that many patients it's in the low thousands per annum so can we use that data to take um you know quantifiable quantifiable or, or statistically relevant data probably not but then again it's a very specific case but as these things get rolled out then Certainly, yes. So there is a commercial relationship that has to be had between these types of systems. So, you know, what data goes where? Does certain data only go to the healthcare professional? Does certain data only go to the pharma company? If the pharma company is essentially buying this data, and that's what it is at the end of the day, it's all about buying data, then there is a sort of accepted wisdom, I think, that they will have access to as much of it as they can possibly get. Um, and I think they will. But right now, you know, we're not seeing that, um, but we will as the numbers start to build. OK, thank you very much. And I had a couple of questions come in um, for you, Simon, on, on the general topic of, um, of the blister pack example that you showed. Um, can you tell us about how the connected technology can make sure that there is the minimum amount of user intervention? Because, of course, in the example that you showed, you're still relying on somebody to be honest, aren't you? <laughs> yes, you are. I mean, it, it is. It, you know, it's possible for somebody to pop the pill and chuck it in the bin. Uh, that that the, the, this this is not uh, something that records the swallowing of the tablet, which actually would would be feasible. There are swallowable tablets, but uh, probably for this particular application, that wouldn't be beneficial. Um, it, it it does rely on the 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 the, the patient to to take the tablets. Um, but other than that, the interaction is, is minimal. That with with the example I showed. Uh, the, the pack itself actually records the, the, the taking of the tab, the popping of the tablet from the pack. Um, there's nothing that the patient needs to do at that point. Uh, and retrieval of the data, even that could be automated, to be honest, because these devices could be connected in through Wi-Fi or, or phone uh, by uh, somebody else to, to ensure that that happens automatically. So, um, yeah, you, you, you can't... Well, I don't think we've uh, understood any solution to, to that particular problem of people not actually taking tablets. OK, thank can, you. Can I, can, oh. I just, can I just jump in and add to that? Yes, yeah, yes, please, please do. Um, si Simon's absolutely right. Um, and for a number of, of years, I've worked in consultancies on behalf of clients trying to solve the problem of has my patient actually taken that dose or have they just given it to the dog or flashed it down the toilet, whatever it might be. So, you know, you, you could take a smart auto injector 
to an orange and the smart auto injector will say, I delivered a dose at, at 10.31 this morning, but unfortunately mm. it can't tell you it's delivered it to an orange. Um, but there are, we are aware of technologies out there that is that are able to recognize certain attributes, if you like, or characteristics of the skin. So um, funnily enough, the skin sensor is a term that's been used for quite a long time within the auto injector environment that relates to something else. So it's basically saying, I'm pushing against the skin so I can trigger. But now in this world of connected devices where we're looking to track adherence, skin sensor can mean something entirely different. Can we apply the same sorts of technologies to a user putting an inhaler to their lips? Absolutely we can. Um, and the more that we can do, and again, bring the cost down of those types of devices, the better it is. It, it's, it's a real challenge, actually, um, but quite an exciting one for those technologically minded people. So over to you guys for that. Uh, very, very nice. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. Um, I have had another question come in, which I think is, is an important one. Um, and we'll just take this one. And David, I see oh, I see David's coming back. So we'll just cut this one very quickly. Um, is there a pull on the NHS side, um, Tony, for, for the value of connected drug delivery or is it a technology push at the moment? <laughs> that's a sorry for chuckling at that that's a really good question um i think it's technology push at the moment um the market demand is is there within the pharmaceutical companies and again i i would just reiterate the point about cost they, they really want this they, they want this data um cynically you might say is that all they want is it just data or actually do they want you know, greater patient outcomes. Well, of course they do. I, I firmly believe that that's the case anyway. Um, within the NHS, uh, I think it's a, a big challenge for the NHS. You know, the, the, the restrictions upon even plugging a USB device into a, a laptop anywhere within the NHS network make this a, a difficult thing. So we can make that a little bit easier for them by having cloud-based systems or, or app-based systems, whatever it might be. So certainly what we're looking at and those three pillars have a significant uh, involvement on the side of the patient, shall we have. Um, but to answer your question directly, I am not particularly seeing any, any demand from the NHS to say, we want this, because I don't think the NHS and the other healthcare providers around the world quite yet see the benefit. I think it will actually suit the UK better because we have a much more joined up system than, than the US, for example. Um, where the demand is coming from at the moment is is actually in in the pharma side of things. You can argue the the toss about you know what I said right at the beginning about the increasing cost of healthcare um, as a result of non adherence, but it, it's quite difficult to quantify that in a way that someone will say we will do this. So again, with the healthcare providers in the US, they're so disjointed, none of them particularly want to put a hand in the pocket and say well we'll pay for this. So it has to come from somewhere else. Okay, thank you very much. So welcome back, David. Um, so um, sorry if it had one or two technical problems and I hope now we can move on to your talk. So um, if I could ask the events organizer to uh, um, unmute um, David. Hi there, David. And David's gonna to talk to us um, today about the benefits of multi-network connectivity, uh, a bit about GSM connectivity. So over to you, David, uh, if you'd like to share your screen now. Thanks, Tom. Apologies for um, the slight issue there. I just had a problem with my laptop. Can everybody see that slide? Yes, we're seeing that now. Thank you, David. Go ahead. Right. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you today about uh, mobile networks and also a little bit about um, more local wireless networks. Um, obviously, uh, we've been talking today about um, the importance of connecting devices. And, you know, whilst a lot of these devices are doing very clever things, um, we also need to obviously make sure that they can connect um, to their end cloud services or the, you know, the servers in a, in a secure and resilient way. So I'm going to be talking about some of the technical details around that and um, hopefully that will be of interest to people. So I suppose there's two kind of aspects to connecting things wirelessly. There's the, what you might classify as the wide area network um, and also the local area network. Um, 
In terms of the wide area network and what you might say is the mobile technologies that we, I suppose, take for granted in a lot of ways um, for connecting things. Um, whilst they are uh, extremely valuable um, you know, technology and service to use for connecting devices, um, obviously in a, in a health and health and, and uh, medical environment, um, you know, the needs for resilience and security are even are even greater than it. they may be in you know a normal commercial or sorry consumer um, usage. So there's lots of um, you know debate around mobile technologies and you know coverage etc around various countries including the UK. Um, I think one of the difficulties you know that makes it difficult to actually identify exactly where the issues are, that coverage maps themselves tend to be contentious. They either are produced by um, operators themselves or by crowdsourcing um, mechanisms. Um, you know, so there's sometimes there's issues around, for example, in crowdsourcing mechanisms, you know, how, how is that uh, device being used? What kind of technology is it using? Um, is it indoor? Is it outdoor? Sometimes those things aren't quite clear. So you can get um, maybe not quite, um, you know, the the, you know, the the sort of real um, situation as it is for the for the user, um, kind of reflected in those. Indoor coverage can also be worse than outdoor. Um, obviously, it depends on the nature of the building, but there are certain buildings which, in themselves, because of their construction, kind of create a Faraday cage effect. So that's something to consider. Um, there's also tends to be a disparity in ge geographical services. It's obvious that um, in terms of rolling out new and mobile technologies that um, you know, the, the big cities and the big business areas may, may well quite often be the first to receive the, um, the newest technologies. And um, sometimes the most difficult to reach areas or the, you know, the most rural areas are you know, st still today don't have you know, very good coverage. So you know, those are issues to, to consider. Um, and also, going back to my first point, it's about the reality of the operational experience. That's, that's the important thing, really. Um, we can try and, you know, map things out, but at the end of the day, it comes down to how users themselves experience the connectivity, uh, whether it's through, you know, a voice service or a data service or um, some other means. So it's difficult to actually get a kind of what you might classify as an, an objective view on this. I've, I've used Ofcom. Ofcom, this is uh, from 2019, and things are always moving, of course, in this industry. So uh, even in, in this sense, it's a little bit out of date, but um, you know, there, there's certainly to be a consensus that um, certainly in terms of 4G, there is still you know, much work to do in terms of getting uh, you know, a, a fuller coverage. Um, there's certain areas which and you know, even surprise to me sometimes, there are some towns which are themselves, you know, not well covered still. And there's some highlights here by Ofcom, for example, Clwyd West in Wales, Barrow and Furness, um, Ribble Valley, and Whitby in North Yorkshire. Um, but this is all kind of also in the context that mobile is becoming more and more important to people. Um, you know, in terms of medical devices themselves and, and also um, healthcare devices, as we've seen before, many of these devices themselves need to be wirelessly connected um, because they reflect the, the, user life, the user's lifestyle in a sense, and they want to be more, you know, um, unlimited in how they use these kind of things. So uh, clearly, uh, mobile is going to, and wireless, local wireless networks are going to be very important in delivering that. As a kind of backdrop, um, we also have to consider that there obviously is, there are roadmaps in terms of um, technologies. We all know about, uh, you know, the, the new ones coming out, which are based around uh, the fifth generation. Um, but there's also some other things which uh, are important to consider. Um, obviously, the, the mobile companies themselves have licenses for certain frequencies, and over time they will probably you know, farm some of the older technology frequencies for the newer ones. We've also got a range of new uh, 
technologies that are based around LTE and 4G, which are trying to kind of increase the range of um, the radio, such as LTE N and narrowband IoT. Um, and we also have obviously around 5G, the shorter range, higher data services. Um, there's also some proprietary technologies which, which are of interest, things like LoRaWAN um, and Sigfox, which um, again provide narrowband services, but can can provide access to because they are um, because of the kind of radio properties can can reach into areas that other devices sometimes can't. And there's also um, secure private LTE, which is um, being looked at by many people in terms of providing a more secure form of, I suppose you might call it Wi-Fi into, into certain hospitals and, and other locations. Just to try and give some a feel for this, and I've just picked some, I'm not gonna say the worst case examples of mobile coverage, but I'll just say worst case. Um, and I've just picked some areas here and they are not ne necessarily representative of, of the whole country, but they're just, just to highlight some some issues that you need to be aware of when you are connecting things through through mobile or wireless technologies. So I picked the rural, a rural area between the uh, on the border of England, Scotland, um, semi-rural area in the South South Downs, and also an area in, in in London. So if I just look at the uh, the Scottish border example, um, if you look at the four different the four networks in the UK, you will see. Um, you know, differences and these, I could have picked anywhere. These were, you know, different networks might be slightly stronger in one area than another. Um, you will also see that there's different sort of shadowing effects, um, obviously caused by the uh, topography in these areas. Um, you know, but there's also some areas that uh, will have no coverage, obviously, from any of the networks. So, you know, those are just things to consider. If I take the uh, the example of West Sussex, um, again there are slight variations um, between networks, um, but also the uh, you know the effect of indoor. If you look at the bottom um, for pictures, you'll see that, and again uh, you know this is kind of this is theoretically um, you know this is a theoretical thing because it's uh, based on Ofcom. Coverage map, so we, you know we have to take these things uh, slightly with a pinch of salt. But the you can see that in these sort of rural areas, even the the slight margins of being indoor can can change how um, how networks um, appear to the end user. Perhaps surprisingly, I, I picked um, a part of East London uh, for another one just to show you how signal can can vary indoors. Um, so the orange areas on these are where you know the signal is slightly uh, is less and uh, this may well be local topography but also maybe you know shadows caused by by large buildings etc so again you know if you're planning a national rollout you have to make take these uh, things into consideration because you will want to be providing services into um hopefully you know the vast majority of people and if somebody has a you know is it is unfortunate to be in a a slight area where there's, there's lower coverage, then you may you will need probably you know to do some site surveys and around that. <clears throat> so what we found um, through you know working with um, lots of different um, projects in this area is that of course you know some some areas will never have any mobile coverage. Um, and we're talking about the most extreme. Um, areas of the UK geographically here. Um, we find that multi-network systems can significantly enhance geographic coverage and, and improve access um, to a variety of services for most people. Um, we also find that in the more marginal areas, position of devices within certain types of buildings can be important. Um, and we also find that by analyzing how things connect, that if you give a device the opportunity to change networks, then generally, it will because there's other things to consider around, you know, whether, um, you know, certain fluctuations in service between uh, different networks. 
And we also find that multi-network systems can be invaluable if you know one of the networks um, suffers a slight um, service interruption. So you know the, the can dice can change networks under those circumstances, and that can obviously improve your your uptime. I just want to quickly talk about some of the misconceptions about mobile systems because for some reason this creates a lot of confusion. Um, <clears throat> I've just broken it down into two areas. The left area is the SIM card, which we all know because we use them in our devices, and the right area is a generic device. Um, the SIM itself, um, I think you have to really think of that as a passport. So that will give the device the capability to move on to a variety of different networks. And that's that's effectively what it does. You can put applets on and things to do, you know, more specialized things, but ultimately it's the device itself on its microprocessor and its logic um, that will um, will control how, how the device connects to various networks. And obviously, you know, some devices will have a battery and some will be mains power. So that can affect how devices wake up and, and connect and their kind of logic of how they operate as well, which can be very important. Um, so it's important in terms of connecting even to a single network to also understand that there's a variety of um, connections and protocols which are going on in these kind of complex services. So there's obviously the, the voice, the data, the SMS um, side of things, but there's also the signaling, which is, you know, the messaging which, which control the kind of sessions that you're having. Um, and they all are, you know, equally important. So, you know, there are a number of companies who provide multi-network services and um, they can allow devices, the ability or the passport, I guess, or I would say, and to, to connect to different networks, which can obviously help the resilience of those network, of those device connections. Perhaps, you know, one of the, one of the points of detail that's worth understanding though, is if a device has the ability to connect and the signal to connect to a number of um, different networks, you may ask which one, which one would it select? And this is really comes down to the logic that's within the device itself in, in many cases. So um, I think it's important if, you, if you're designing systems that are to work with the mobile networks is to understand that because um, you probably will want um, in most cases to use what we classify as the manual me me mechanism, not the automatic. The automatic generally will look for the strongest signal. That may not be the best um, signal for your type of application. So we tend to uh, recommend that people use the manual selection and have logic around that. They may, um, for example, using data service, they may uh, connect to a check connection to the service quickly. And then if that's okay, connect to that network. And if it doesn't, obviously move on to another one. So, um, you know, that's a key area to understand that Quite often people think it will be the SIM that does that, but in most cases it will be the device itself. I'm just going to quickly run through two um, case studies of the use of multi-network, which I just think provide some interesting um, learnings, I guess. The first one is, is related to um, some um, use of multi-network within um, some lone health workers who are using a variety of devices for like ID tags, and for um, mobile phones and, and voice fobs, et cetera. And also a second one where we did a small um, proof of concept around home health munch munching, which was trying to understand the issues around using smart home um, technologies, which is more data-based. Starting with the, um, the health workers, um, we, we, we find that, you know, I say using multi-network improves network connections and improves performance in most areas. Um, and that, you know, it's across the various voice, SMS and data services. Obviously this can also help in terms of device management and configuration because most devices will have a maintenance function, um, you know, around firmware updates, et cetera. And quite often they also 
as well having some sort of interactive service with um, end users. They also have um, some kind of automatic background processes like inactivity alerts, um, geofencing, um, fall detection, and also some, uh, you know, obviously connections to alarm receiving centers, et cetera, where, you know, the need to actually have um, that kind of backup. So yes, yeah, some of the learnings which I've already covered, but you know, in terms of it's important to understand the device network selection of, of you know how a device will work, so you can make sure that works for you. It's also important to understand that closed and open user groups um, can be important. You know how how open do you want the mobile mobile network to be for you? Would you want to be very closed so you can control the numbers that can be you know dialed between, for example, so you don't get you know, nuisance calls or, um, you know, messages coming in, which you may not want and might interrupt the service. You may want messaging services, which are configurable to each user so that they can direct people onto other members of their team, for example. Um, you may want, you know, enhanced device security, you know, in terms of uh, virtual private networks or, or more. Um, <clears throat> We also find ourselves that's very important to have sophisticated forms of network monitoring so that you can know exactly what's going on on all the networks and you can, um, you know, uh, manage, manage accordingly. Um, very important, obviously, things like geo redundancy um, so that, if, you know, one location goes down, another will, will take over. Multiple nodes, backups and um, signaling infrastructure to make sure that, um, you know, you have that complete resiliency. Um, and we also think it's important to have some other features around this kind of, these kind of services, things like um, you can have uh, situations where you can measure approximately the, the location of somebody from the mass data. Um, you know, so if we find ourselves sometimes that within buildings, certain buildings, GPS doesn't work, of course, but you can find you know, there are other mechanisms you can triangulate to, to find somebody. And um, the second, set, second uh, case study I just want to quickly go through is so it's a very small scale proof of concept. And we wanted to understand um, how local area network technologies such as Zigbee and Bluetooth, which are used in lots of medical devices and uh, home monitoring devices could be used potentially in um, let's, you know, sort of health monitoring environment. Um, and that was put through a, a local gateway, which was mobile connected. Um, through a multi-network system. So we had things like, uh, you know, uh, we had a blood pressure uh, sensor. We also had a, a pulse monitor, weight scales, smoke alarms, uh, movement sensors. Uh, there was a quality, smart plugs to know where the activity was going on. And just in terms of an overall architecture that was going through the mobile networks, because these, these sites were actually in very um, remote locations. So we wanted to understand you know, the issues around that. And they would be ingested um, through a cloud service and then um, administered um, and the, any key messages sent to uh, you know, the alarm receiving centers or in, interested parties. Um, what we found from this, just as some learning points, was that um, mobile coverage was, 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 was tend to be good and there was no real issues around that. Um, but it's you know, important to measure not only the GSM, the mobile wide area network performance, but also we found important to measure how devices themselves connect with their local gateway. Um, because quite often people put things in, in areas where they can't you know, um, connect to the to the gateway, and that's that's important to know. So if it's on the right on the edge of, for example, Bluetooth range. You want to know if there's there's an intermittent um, break in that communication. Um, because we were connecting lots of people, uh, different devices, you know, medical devices and sort of smart home devices. Um, we found that Bluetooth tended to be in, implemented in a um, more nuanced way than Zigbee. Which perhaps is more standardized. So we found there was, you know, more kind of
kind of learning in terms of that and crafting the, the various communications. Um, there's also a balance between the, the frequency of measurement of things and also if the device is reliant on a battery. So you have to you know, make some calculations around that. Um, and you know, even better if you can have um, remote monitoring systems which allow you to measure um, you know, how, how um, the state of batteries, for example, or the state of the device if it hasn't got offline, et cetera. So you can take um, proactive decisions around that. And one of the big things I would say is that even small numbers of these devices, if they're reporting regularly and create enormous quantities of data. And I think that's one of the big challenges going forward is going to be how we make sense of a lot of this kind of data and actually make it useful. So yeah, I guess some, of, some more learnings from this. Um, I think one of the difficulties is knowing what's a routine and what isn't. Um, you know, you might have somebody who's having a lie in, in bed and uh, they, they're getting contacted because they haven't got out of bed and that's their was their normal routine. But obviously that's, that's going to um, have a problem in terms of adoption if, if those kind of things become irritating. Um, and the decision making around these things therefore becomes critical because, um, you know, we involved nurse teams in, in some of these um, tests and you know, they were concerned that these kind of technologies could potentially place greater strain on, on resources if you know they did the, the wrong sent wrong type of messages or the wrong um, you know conclusions were drawn from them. Um, the other thing is you know in, in terms of you're sending alerts at certain times of the night, do, is the NHS or care services are they able to cope with that? Um, and also, I think there's also a concern that if you use these kind of technologies, then you may lose some of the face-to-face -face visits. Now, these were in very remote locations, so face-to-face -face visits are actually very important to a lot of people. So, you know, you don't want to lose that as well. Um, people, some people felt that um, these kind of technologies may help reduce um, anxiety for certain people. I can also see the other side, you know, people increasing anxiety. Um, if people are constantly monitoring their own blood pressure, for example, will that increase their anxiety? Um, <clears throat> obviously, privacy and independence is a key, key issue and concern. And I kind of there's a general feeling once we kind of reviewed everything that really these services are, you know, probably based upon the right, um, you know, teams um, reviewing is this right for this patient and obviously consent, et cetera. So just things to, to, be, you know, to be considered. So just think quickly in conclusion, um, we believe it's incredibly important to monitor services on a real-time basis and to establish use, real user experiences on any kind of mobile or wireless network um, to ensure that the communication plans around them match the use cases that you want and the kind of devices you're trying to use. Um, continuously invest in, in optimizing networks and you know, create strong relationships around the industry that understand why this is important in terms of resilience and security and to you know, provide end-to-end -end solutions around that. And also um, the importance of monitoring local area network connectivity of devices. I think that might be something that gets forgotten about a little bit. And just finally, the importance of partnerships working and collaborating with um, you know, people who are experts in the health and medical industry and making sure that um, everybody has a voice and a say. So thank you very much. That's, uh, that's my Thank pleasure. you very much, David. That's, uh, that's really appreciated. And you finished right on, right on the, the end of the time. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I'd like to thank all the speakers um, who've joined the session today. I'm sorry we had the um, we had the Q and A um, in, as an impromptu in, in the middle um, due to our small technical hitch there. Um, we've received a couple of questions for for the speakers that we haven't been able to come to in the session today, but I, we will be putting those um, to our speakers. And for those of you that have asked the questions, we hope to be able to provide you with those answers. If you would like to type more questions in, please do so. Um, the the Q and A will will remain open and so I'd, I'd like to say thank you um, again and we remind you that the next
next session will be starting at two o'clock and you can use the same link um, for, for Zoom for that session. And I look forward to seeing you. Then we're going to be talking about private and public financing. And we have Sarah Nelson, who is the Deputy Programme Manager for Digital um, Digital Health London, um, who's joining us this afternoon. So I'm really looking forward to her talking about um, the activities of, of that organisation. So please do join us again um, this afternoon and thank you again for joining this morning. Okay, take care. Hi everyone. Um, welcome to those who've joined uh, the webinar for the first time and um, welcome back to everyone who joined for one of the previous sessions. So my name is Dr. Tom Harvey. I work for CPI and I'm leading CPI's team in medtech development on electronics and photonics technologies. I'm going to be chairing the webinar session this afternoon. Um, also on our panel this afternoon is Kevin Keeley, who's the chief executive of Medilink UK. So both of us would like to welcome you to the uh, webinar this afternoon. It's great to see so many people joining us for this for this virtual event series. So on Tuesday, we hosted the first three sessions of the webinar covering the topics of medical needs, information, governance and regulation. And this morning we talked about technologies that were relevant for connected medical devices. And this afternoon, I'm pleased to say we're going to cover the important uh, topic of funding, both private um, and uh, public based funding. And I'd like to start by thanking all the speakers who are going to take part in the session today um, and passing on the benefits of their experience. So just a couple of housekeeping things before we start. Um, microphones for the audience will be on mute throughout the session this afternoon. So if you'd like to send us a message uh, and ask a question to today's speakers, um, we will respond and answer those questions in a Q&A session, which will happen at the end of the presentations. Uh, this afternoon. So um, I, I look forward to, to receiving your questions and, and we'll take them as we as we come. So um, I'd like just um, to, to start the webinar shortly and can I just remind the speakers that uh, to try to keep to the 20 minutes um, for the presentations and that will give us time for a very useful Q&A uh, discussion. So without further ado, um, I'd like to try and get started and uh, I see Michael Kipping has joined so I'd like to invite Michael to unmute himself and to share his screen. Michael is Innovation Lead at Innovate UK um, in responsible for the Aging Society Health and Nutrition team um, and I know he's been involved in the Biomedical Catalyst um, grant uh, program and today his talk is going to be talking about different types of support that Innovate UK makes available to companies. So Michael, if you are ready to go, please. Uh... Yep, fantastic. Hi there. I look forward to it. So if you could uh, share your screen, please. looks like it's coming through. You're on presenter mode there, yeah. Michael. Let's try again. There we go. That's looking good. On you go. Thank you very much. OK, thanks, Tom. Um, Firstly, apologies for the moustache. Uh, I'm doing Movember, by the way. Uh, so, um, so firstly, thanks for, for inviting me along today. Um, apologies for, for my technical difficulties and, and running a tiny bit behind. I want to take the, the 20 minutes to briefly run through a range of uh, support mechanisms that are available to, to, to companies in this space from Innovate UK. So if you're not... Um, haven't previously dealt with Innovate UK before. I'll just quickly give you a quick overview of, of who we are and what we are. So we belong to a large organisation called UK Research and Innovation that brought together the seven research councils, Research England and Innovate UK. And our annual budget is in the region of £7 billion. Now, Innovate UK's role within UKRI is, is 
kind of akin to to research council for industry it's not strictly speaking um the right definition but that's that's kind of how we operate and we're really uh looking to try and drive productivity and economic growth by supporting businesses like yours to develop innovative new products and um, create revenues create jobs so on and so forth and we're, and we're at the heart of the the government's industrial strategy and drive to uh, have UK R&D expenditure reaching 2.4% of GDP. Um, our annual budget is is in the region of 1.3 billion, usually. Um, so just just quick overview of the the UK um, life science sector. So it's, it's hugely important to the UK economy and and obviously um, health providers as well. Um, and it's it's a, got a key role within the the government's industrial strategy. We're ranked highly in the Global Innovation Index uh, across the whole of health and life sciences. There's around two hundred and fifty thousand employees, probably about half of them within uh, health tech, and um, create significant turnover and, and exports. We have kind of a higher proportion of unicorn companies in the UK uh, compared to the rest of Europe and Israel. And the UK is still an attractive destination for um, VC investment. And, and I think the COVID pandemic has really um, driven home the importance of, of innovation and, and of the health tech uh, and digital um, healthcare product um, sector in particular, um, because it was you know health health tech products that really um, made have made the difference so far. You know, we're still still waiting on a uh, on a vaccine, but hopefully that will be coming in the new year. But it was um, products that that companies like yourselves uh, developed that have really really helped us sort of manage the the situation. So just broadly, um, this slide gives an overview of all of the activities that that, that we undertake. So. Over on the left hand side, our bread and butter is, is providing financial support um, to, to, to companies in a range of sectors. On the whole, it, it tends to be state aid funding, so non dilutive state aid funding. But we do provide innovation loans, we do, um, we do run SPRI procurement contracts, and also uh, evaluating still investor partnerships. So we, we try and uh, explore and evaluate different ways of providing financial support for, for different businesses. Alongside that, we also have uh, our innovation and growth advisory services and, and the centers and networks. So the knowledge transfer network, for instance, is uh, part of the Innovate UK family and receives around 80% of its funding from us, um, but a completely separate organization, completely independent of Innovate UK. And, and the same with the Enterprise Europe Network and the Catapult Centres, um, including CPI, that receive some of their funding from us, but most of the funding is, is generated independently of us and, and operating independently of us. Uh, we also have a focus on developing people um, through the Knowledge Transfer Partnerships, which has been running for 40 odd years now, Future Leaders Fellowships, Women in Innovation, um, and uh, young innovators program as well. And then the final section is around global innovative programs. So we run global expert missions, um, global business innovation programs. So GEMS tend to be um, sort of fact-finding missions. Uh, GBIPs tend to be more um, actually introducing companies to organizations um, to, to, to try and develop sort of collaborative approaches and, and, and potential partnerships. And then we have programs like Eureka, for instance, that can actually provide the funding for those uh, for those collaborations to happen. So we're just uh, just in the final stages of of awarding a Eureka program around healthy aging, for instance. Um, and the Eureka network consists of uh, forty countries across the the globe, and um, and really facilitates that sort of cross cross country collaboration. So from a funding and finance perspective, um, the, the, the first, what I'll do is really focus on the, the predictable 
um, funding mechanisms. So we do have sort of ad hoc competitions that come up that I'm really focusing around the ones that, that, that are typically more, more predictable. So SMART is our so an open competition. So it's a free for all for companies in any sector. And um, we typically have four competitions a year uh, and uh, typically at 25 million pounds a time. Now we had the SI yesterday and um, the, the, this competition will carry on as is into the future. It's, it's one of our uh, core priorities. Um, okay, um, so we've got the, the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund. So again, there's a large focus in there around um, the ageing society, um, which isn't, so there are occasional ad hoc opportunities for companies within um, ISCF, but these tend to be much bigger sort of kind of holistic uh, programmes that, that have multi-year funding. Uh, KTPs are quite, quite a, you know, quite a good, um, quite a good program for companies seeking to have bring in sort of new skills and expertise, um, perhaps from a from a university, for instance, or research partner, um, just for a limited amount of time. So it's it's good for the individual coming into the company because they gain additional skills and expertise, and good for the company because they get that additional resource that's partly funded by by Innovate UK. Program that I look after is called the Biomedical Catalyst. Uh, and it's the primary Innovate UK funding mechanism for supporting UK health and life science SMEs. So it's been running since 2012 and we've provided around 210 million pounds of funding in that time. And, and just in the sort of final process of, um, uh, or final stages of, of awarding uh, 30 million pounds at the moment. Now, despite its name, it is technology agnostic. So, you know, we, we support companies across the whole breadth of, of health and life sciences. And around half the projects are within sort of medical devices diagnostics, which, um, which has really helped in terms of like the leveling up side of things, because these companies tend to be far more evenly distributed across the UK, as opposed to sort of drug delivery and vaccines, um, medicines companies that, that still tend to be based in the Golden Triangle. Um, and in terms of the programme, generates significant, uh, significant value uh, for taxpayers. So we, we estimate around £4.70 per, for, for every pound invested, which is well above the, the, the Treasury's Green Book requirements. So to put that another way, uh, the programme's at least as effective as R&T tax credits. Uh, we also run investor partnerships. So part of the challenge with our programmes is that under state aid rules, which will undoubtedly carry on with after 1st of January, we can only provide up to 70% funding for, for companies. So that means that you have to find an additional um, bit of match funding, which can be really challenging. So the aim of investor partnerships is to have a, a pool of VCs or angels already lined up and they decide which projects they're potentially willing to, to support. And then we can put in the, 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 you know, the additional money, um, assuming that the, the VC and the company can come um, and, and agree terms together. So it's, it's, this approach was really to try and, to try and give companies additional options in, in terms of getting the 100% money. Works, works for some companies, doesn't work for others, um, but it's, it's uh, just another, approach that we're uh, continuing to look at. Again, in, innovation loans, typically not something that's that's necessarily attractive to, to companies in this space, um, because you do need to demonstrate um, how, how to repay some of these loans. It's typically companies that are quite close to market or or on the market. Um, but, but a really good, really good scheme, all the same, well worth looking at. Um, depending on where you are as a business. In terms of the centres and networks, so I briefly mentioned the knowledge transfer partner, um, tra knowledge transfer network earlier. So, you know, they're part of the Innovate UK family and, you know, it, it's free to, to sort of talk to them. They can support you with um, sort of reviewing applications um, they run events and uh, networking events. 
Um, and a good resource if you're trying to find uh, or identify partners that can support your business, either suppliers or, or, or partners. So again, well, well worth reaching out to them if you have specific challenges. Likewise, with the Enterprise Europe Network, again, their, their support is on a more one-to-one -one basis, um, but again, largely supported by Innovate UK, and they can um, support you uh, through their large network of advisors and, and also assist you looking at potentially expanding overseas. Skip through that one. Um, so the Catapult Network. Um, so the Catapult Network was set up to provide uh, sort of facilities and expertise to support companies. So uh, CPI, for instance, and provide you know, a huge range of, of uh, facilities, expertise to support companies um, kind of looking at the development of their process, perhaps scaling up a process um, so they can then sort of move ahead and, and commercialize. So part of their, their budget comes from us. A large part is, is self-generated. Um, but again, we've got the, these catapults uh, networks uh, covering a range of different sectors. Interestingly, with the catapults, um, you may already be aware, but because they're not part of Innovate UK itself, they can uh, collaborate with you on applications to us. And, and it's quite common that we have receive applications that have um, CPI, for instance, or the Medicines Discovery Catapult or Cellogene Therapy Catapult as partners, as grant receiving partners on applications and they, they can provide a lot of support in terms of writing applications as well so uh, a really really useful outlook uh, so in terms of global programs I've kind of talked uh, briefly about this already but kind of these are the uh, sort of five five areas that we, we we tend to sort of play in really and what we're doing as an organization is really focusing on um, perhaps doing a bit less in terms of, you know, because we, we, we have lots of activities going on, but perhaps doing a little bit less, but doing it in a far more long term strategic way and building, um, putting the building blocks in so that we can have a kind of long standing relationships with uh, with target countries. So, for instance, um, we're having lots of discussions with South Korea at the moment who have lot of expertise in, in electronics um, within digital health and um, which could be really useful for for UK companies to tap into and and, and vice versa uh, and by taking a much longer term view we can then engage with the IT to, to help build that sort of export or inward investment um, pipeline and and also sort of provide a more you know, a slightly easier pathway to, to market for companies. I mentioned Eureka. Um, again, we're going to, this isn't an EU um, uh, approach. It's a, it's, it's a 40 country approach, includes the likes of Canada, Israel, South Korea, uh, various others. Really, really nice program. Uh, allows multiple company and um, multiple countries to collaborate around a, a common uh, competition, common cause. Again, it crosses all sectors. Um, alongside this, we probably will run more bilateral competitions as well. Um, but there is the, the important thing to take away is that there are opportunities um, to, to receive support for doing innovative activities um, and, and building um, sort of innovative partnerships and, and products with other countries. And that's that's me. Thank you very much uh, for that, Michael. Um, so I think there's a few um, good points and suggestions raised there for the audience. So I'd like to just remind everyone, if you've got a question um, for Michael, please um, put the question in the Q&A and we'll come to that um, after the end of the other presentations today. And um, I'm sure your question will get answered. Uh, I'm sure you might get a few questions there about the international internationalization, Michael. So I think that's probably a very interesting topic for a number of people 
people at, at the webinar today. So thank you very much. Um, so now I'd like to move on to and introduce our next speaker, please. Um, our next speaker is Sarah Nelson, um, who is the Deputy Program Director for Digital Health London. And we're really pleased to have Sarah with us um, this afternoon. She is uh, an experienced nurse with over 27 years in the NHS, apparently. Um, and so I'm sure she is super qualified to tell us about what's happening at the AHSN and particularly about the Digital Accelerator Support Scheme. Sarah, over to you if you'd like to unmute and share your screen, please. Thank you very much, Tom. Yes, let me share my screen and uh, bring up the uh, presentation. It will be in that mode first and from the beginning present the slides. Okay, is that all ready and that's looking good. We can see the slides. Thank you. So, uh, as Tom said, uh, absolutely, I am Deputy Programme Director at Digital Health London. Um, and I'm also, as well as the four parts of the programme that you'll hear about today, um, a nurse who is working with NHSEC under the Chief Nursing Information Officer, advising her on the um, strategy and plans for nursing through the digital future. So, very interesting space that I'm in and it feels like a second career to me, um, even though I have still got my nursing registration. Let's go on to why we're here today. Um, like Michael, I am here to talk about the support and opportunities that we can actually give you as innovators um, and how we can work with you to support the challenges that we have within the NHS. I'm going to be talking about the AHSN network. I'm also going to be talking about the Digital Health London programmes that will be able to support you. So AHSNs, you may have heard the term, AHSN stands for the Academic Health Science Network, and there are actually 15 of them across the country. Um, 15 separate organisations, but work as a network of networks. Our strength is that we really op operate locally, so we know our own areas and we know our stakeholders in that area. But we bring that together and because of the trusted relationships we have, we're then able to work collaboratively across the country to help with spread and adoption. They work together for three overarching goals. The first is that of improving health. We identify solutions that can actually help to support the health and care organisations that are out there. We drive down cost by looking at how we can save money and save staff time. And we can look at the economic growth and stimulating the economic growth. And that's something that goes across both the AHSN networks and the other parts of the program, because it's really important that we find companies that we can support that will understand how they can get the best out of the NHS and social care um, and grow their companies. And by growing themselves, that actually improves the offering to the NHS. You'll see from here that there are nine programs um, that we have and priorities within the AHSN network. I'm gonna to speak to you about two today because although some of these may actually be more of, uh, you may be interested in, two of them specifically, I think, will be more applicable to all of you. And those two are the Innovation Pathway and the Innovation Exchange. So the Innovation Pathway. The Innovation Pathway is a structure that's used um, to work with both SMEs and organisations to help them to um, go, take their ideas and actually bring them into implementation. So it takes them through this structure and there's a range of offerings that we can give depending on what stage you're at. Now all of the AHC network work slightly differently and they all have slightly different areas of expertise. So you won't get all of this offering from all of the AHSN network, but as a whole network, we cover all of these areas. So it may be that you have an idea and that we can support you with the culture around that um, particular um, pathway or area. We can help support you into the marketplace within that particular area or to look and find out, actually, we thought we'd be working in this area, but we may well end up working into this area. We can support you with the finance and things like Tom has been talking about, things to do with Innovation UK grants or investments and support you through that process. We can help you to evaluate the product that you have at the moment. And we can also um, look at supporting your business through business support. 
brokering relationships for you and also um, then taking it through to adoption. So depending on where you are in your pro with your uh, with your particular product and where you want to go and what you need, that's worth looking at thinking about where you are and what AHN Next Networks would be able to support you. The second thing that the AHN Networks do is they work through an innovation exchange. And what that means is that we look at what we we need to respond to the health challenges in our area. So there are the 15 and I cover South London within the Health Innovation Network, but then the North, West, uh, the North London ones as well. And we need to know what those health challenges are in our local environments, and then we can identify products that will be able to support those. But what we can do as an offer for you is there are always innovation clinics and innovation exchange clinics which are open to anybody and is a one hour support to say, where's your product? product what does it do within our area is there any ins is there anything that particularly might be of help we give you the support through a discussion um, and we can see how you might fit in each year a small number of those will actually go through to the accelerators access collaborative that's discussed on the bottom and those are a small number of um AH, of, of innovations that we've seen that we think would do really well through spread and adoption. So that's why um, we then can take it nationally. This is an idea of the impact that the AHN networks have had. These results are from an AHN national survey um, and shows how many companies we can be involved with and have interactions with. The investment leveraged um, is a high level investment. There's actually two particular companies that had 150 million and 50 million each and that's certainly helped the investment side of things but across the board between last year and this year we've had an increase in, in success and investment within our companies that we've been supporting there's something that we as digital health london are really pleased because there's a number of these that are actually related directly to the work that we've been doing within digital health london so I now get the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about digitalhealth.london and what we can offer as the support um, for innovators in London's healthcare and social care sector. You'll notice these are our partners. Our partners are the three academic health centres within London. So that is the Health Innovation Network in South London, as I was just speaking about. There's UCL partners and Imperial College Health partners who are the North London AHN networks. The three of those came together um, with Chelsea and Westminster Hospital and the city to support innovation going forwards and um, digital innovation. Where the AHSN networks don't always do digital, they do non-digital innovation as well. Digital Health London does purely digital. We are supported by the Mayor of London and our half of our funding comes through the European Union um, Regional Development Fund. Just as a, uh, a caveat, it is not a problem as of this year. We are still okay to carry on and we have at least another two years on the program. So there will be more space since coming available. So our vision, our vision is to enable the entrepreneurs and the healthcare professionals to actually turn that idea, as it says, into tangible improvements for staff and patients. The bottom picture here is um, our launch last year. And during our launch, one of our companies, uh, all of our companies had the opportunity to pitch. And then we did roundtable events with, with the NHS stakeholders in the environment. And during that roundtable, this gentleman from Sweatcoin and this gentleman from Southwest London had a conversation. And that started a really good collaboration between Southwest London and Sweatcoin that meant that they were able to do something called the, uh, the Diabetes Decathlon and they were able to make significant changes within the Southwest London area. And what was really nice for me as an NHS member of staff was that uh, Chris, the gentleman on the left, said that this company were particularly good to work with. They actually found it a pleasure to work with innovators who were um, so good to work with. And this is what we like to do to encourage our teams to work really closely with the NHS stakeholders that they're working with. Digital Health London has four programmes. So there's the Accelerator programme, which is the sort of the main programme that we've run 
um, and it was the original program as part of digitalhealth.london. That is our support for um, companies that is a whole year that we will spend with the companies helping them to develop and grow. They have a NHS navigator who is allocate, allocated to them to actually support them through this. And it, as I say, is a 12 month program. The Launchpad program is a smaller version and is only about 12 hours of support. So in the accelerator, you'll get over 100 hours support. But in the Launchpad, it's specifically 12 hours to help you to launch a product to the NHS gives you the opportunity to refine the product, refine the cons, refine the potential uh, ins in a very short period of time. And we found that the accelerator had grown so much that the companies that were coming along for interview were at a much higher level and much further along the line. And some of these great innovations weren't getting the opportunity to actually be involved. So that's why the launch pad came about. The evidence generator gives us the opportunity to support evidence generation um, and the importance of evidence generation within this area. And the Pioneer Fellowship is um, a separate part that I won't be discussing today, but is about how we support the NHS staff to bring innovation into, the, uh, into their organizations. The Accelerator, these are, this is our mugshot of our team of navigators. Um, as you will see, there is a number of different uh, um, staff from different areas within the NHS. We have clinical, operational and managerial experience here. And this is the difference between our accelerator and other accelerators. You'll see other accelerators out there and you've got to find which one works for you. This one works specifically with NHS staff to look at answering NHS problems. And all of this, these, this team, as well as the core team behind them of comms and operational support, um, support all of the companies through the year um, to understand their work within the NHS. So our accelerator offering, um, we go from our launch event to what is actually our showcase event. And between those two time, uh, those two events, one at the beginning of the year and one at the end of the year, you have the opportunity to refine your offering, we can review opportunities that are out there, we can broker relationships, and we can support the peer-to-peer -peer learning through the different sessions that are mentioned on this slide. This was, again, another independent evaluation, but this was of the, of the Digital Health at London programme itself, the Accelerator programme. And the two parts that I'd like to point out that we're really proud of is one is the over 14 times return on investment. So for every one pound by the NHS through the HSN networks, there is £14.50 return on investment. We were shocked when we heard that ourselves, but that was really help, really good to hear. The other thing is our jobs created. Um, it's really helped with that stimulating the economic growth. The fact that we've had 513 new jobs created and of which 66% of it was through direct support, as the companies have said themselves, through direct support from the accelerator in making them believe in themselves and helping them with realizing the benefits that they can bring. I'd like to introduce you now to our cohort five companies. We select our companies based on the, um, their ability to meet the challenges of the NHS. We look at business need and whether the NHS needs them. We look at business credibility and we look at, is there a fit to our particular um, accelerator? As I say, you've got to pick the accelerator that's right for you. Here, we've mapped them against the NHS plan. This is just a case study of one of our companies, Livy. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, they were on our um, accelerator. They've grown significantly, specifically secondary to uh, COVID. And um, if you're part of our programme, you stay a part of our family. You don't move on after the one year and we don't see you again. We still want to celebrate your successes. And we do so. The launch pad, as I say, if you don't feel like you're ready for the accelerator program, and there's only 20 spaces um, for uh, companies for that, the launch pad program runs a couple of times a year. And that actually looks at the lower um, uh, sort of earlier stage companies, I should say. And we support them in exactly the same way through having the workshops and support, but it's just at a much smaller level. 
just because you've gone onto the launch pad doesn't mean you can't get onto the accelerator. Two of our launch pads have gone onto the accelerator and have been successful throughout two years of working with us. Um, 19 new products that we've had from the company, and as Arden says on that uh, particular piece of the slide, it still helped them. Even 12 hours of support can make a big difference. Our generator offer is just, it's so important nowadays that whatever we're doing is evidence-based. Everything is looked at in such a detail to make sure that there's either a return on investment or that there's actually some evidence behind why we are doing this and why we are spending NHS money. So it's really important for us to support you to look at the evidence for standard frameworks, but also to broker those relationships with SMEs and research institutions. As you can see, we've done that with 37 research institutions or 37 uh, particular research partnerships. But the other thing that we've done is agreed that it's really important for everyone to know about how important research is, which was why we delivered this four part webinar series so that everyone can understand why it's really important at the moment. I want to say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, but also thank you for letting us speak today. If there is anything that you want to uh, know, please drop us. Um, obviously, we've got the Q&A session shortly, but uh, drop us a, a line at info at digitalhealth.london or follow us on Twitter. Thank you very much, Tom. Well, thank you very much, Sarah. Yes, um, a lot of content there for um, the audience to take in. So that that's great. Um, can I just remind uh, everyone again, you've got the opportunity for the Q&A. Um, so the, the questions box is open and waiting. So please do type in some questions. And I can see a few questions coming through now. So if you like to, to put yours on there, um, we'll, we'll have a discussion about those shortly. Um, so I'd like to move on now um, to the final talk of uh, this session, and I'd like to introduce Mari Dillon, please. Mari is a Relationship Manager with CPI Enterprises, which is the new investment engagement venture capital arm of CPI. Um, so Mari's got a wealth of experience in early stage tech fundraising, project management, and outward facing um, public and private finance. So she's going to talk to us today about raising finance for your business, which is, let's face it, a very, very important topic to consider alongside everything else. So Mari, can I pass over to you uh, if you'd like to unmute and share your screen now, please. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, I've obviously got a hard, hard axe to follow, so I'll, I'll try my best to keep up the, the momentum. Um, so I'm just sharing my screen now. Can everyone see that? It's not come through quite yet. Just give it a moment. No. Okay, still waiting for that. Two seconds. Not quite sure. Yep, that's looking promising. Sorry about that, everyone. If you'd Here like to put go. that onto slideshow, you'll be you'll be okay now. Perfect. Perfect. Um, we can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom's obviously given a, a bit of a brief introduction. Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to give a, a bit of an overview of um, the sort of investment perspective of, of, of you know, looking at med tech companies. Um, just for, for a little bit of background, um, so I have spent the last sort of 10 years in the public private um, investment early stage um, landscape. I, um, I was head of operations for an early stage biotech company um, who raised in the UK and the UAE. Um, and then I, I actually went to, to work with um, Michael and, and colleagues at Innovate UK through KTN. Um, I worked on the innovation loans, um, innovation partnerships, competitions um, on the access to funding and finance team. Um, since then, I've been working in consultancy around early stage fundraising and, um, you know, ended up in the Catapult Networks. Um, so, so very much part of that public private piece um, and engaging with investors throughout the, along the way. Um, I, um, I, as Thomas said, um, I, I, I work as an investor relationships manager for um, CPI Enterprises. Um, this is a fairly new and exciting subsidiary of, of CPI. Um, we have a, a, a couple of legacy investments. We've got a small portfolio and we invest in pre-seed and seed um, companies um, 
um, who are aligned to our, um, our capabilities and expertise. Um, and we're looking at tickets around the £100,000 mark. Um, we, like any other investor, have um, you know, run, run a process, very selective, um, and regularly have an investment committee. Um, CPI Enterprises is quite unique because um, we, we want to invest sweat equity or a combination of sweat and cash equity um, into companies um, so that they can utilize our, our fantastic facilities, which I know our, our, my colleagues will have already gone into. Um, and quite simply, we see a lot of medtech. Um, and I think that's that's partially testament to, to our colleagues in, in who are working in medtech and then the engagement that they do. But, but just generally, I think there's there's been quite a lot of, of activity from the medtech point of view, um, just with significant growth in that sector around the sort of 2017-18 mark and that continuing um, um, and to now. And I think that that's sort of in part to do with that increasing expenditure on healthcare and um, the changing demographic, the aging population. So from an investor's point of view, it's quite an exciting market if you can invest in a, in a med tech application that perhaps could improve the quality of, of people's lives immeasurably um, or the efficiency of systems in, in, in that arena. Um, but I think with, with this talk, I want to strip this back a little bit to, to just give that very early stage view of well, who are these investors and um, you know, why are they doing it? And I think that's really important for founders to consider when they're out there fundraising um, for, for any stage, actually, of what the motivations are and, and what types of investors um, and what models they're using. So, you know, it would be lovely if we all had a million pounds. The reality is actually, um, yes, you, you may come across wealthy individuals investing their own money, but a lot of the money that's in the early stage marketplace, that is institutional money. So they are individuals like myself who are um, scouting for companies, looking for investments um, relative to a thesis. And, um, and that money is perhaps because of the organization or, or because of, of other high net worths or institutional funds. Um, and, and I think just, you know, going back to that, well, why are these people engaged? Why are they in this marketplace? Well, a lot of the time motivations is, is partly around giving back. There could be that, you know, I'm an angel investor and um, I, I, I have, I've retired, I've worked in the NHS all my life. I've done fairly well. I've, you know, I've, I, I, I care about that particular um, area of medicine um, and that particular um, um, sector or subcategory. Um, it might be that, you know, technology just generally I'm excited about investing in technology I, I see the impacts that it would make into our, our, our future um, or, or potentially that you know I like doing the mentoring and I like being part of the ecosystem and engaging with that ecosystem uh, and what it what it brings but uh, you know realistically there's also that that financial side to it you know investors are investing because they want to have a share in profits um, and they want to see that growth of of the company which is where you know you hear the term return on investment regularly um, being talked about but also there's 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 ways that drive that appetite into the early stage market so things like the um, um seed enterprise investment scheme and also the this um the um enterprise investment scheme which allow tax breaks for investors to invest um, a certain amount of money and um, bring that money into a very risky area of the market and, and, and they're incentivized by a 30% or a 50% um, tax break. So I think useful to bear that in mind when you're approaching investors and you're thinking about going down the investment route. Um, typically, when we talk about investment as well, private investment, um, we, we talk about friends and family, then going to angel syndicates and then perhaps going to um, to uh, venture capitalists. Uh, that, that doesn't have to be the case. I think, you know, it's your journey and you need to think about what types of finance are right for you at what time, uh, you know, for, for the business. However, just to give you a flavor of that, you know, when we think about friends and family, um, and, and all of these vet investors, they, they'd be looking for say 15 to 20, 25% of your, of your business per round in exchange for that capital investment. Um, so you are selling selling part of the business so that you can accelerate it and, and, and hopefully reach your milestones quicker. Um, the, the, you know, in, normally early stage, where do we start? Friends and families. These are the people who are surrounding us. They trust you, they know you, they know that you understand your area of expertise and, and you're the person to drive this. Reality is though, they're gonna be less sensitive to what return that has. Um, not always, but they, they have different motivations there. Um, then we tend to think about um, our angel networks. 
Um, so there's 1,500 um, 1, active angels across the UK. Um, I wish I had a stat from EdTech. Um, unfortunately, though, angels are quite elusive. They, they do, you know, they don't want to shout about being an angel because everyone would be asking them for money. Um, but a lot of angels, how do they invest? They either invest as, a, as a, an individual, um, high net worth and putting money into particular businesses, but, but often they're part of angel syndicates. That's so that they can see lots of different companies, um, quality deal flow, and also invest more as a group. Um, and those investments can range, um, as I've said here, um, 10K, 5K through to 500K. And you do get some angel networks nowadays who are, are really kind of pushing more into what was traditionally your early stage VC around the million mark. Um, and there's there's a lot, actually quite a lot of angel groups in the UK that would, would invest in med tech, not a massive amount who are specific to med tech, but then you do have people like Angels and Med City. Um, and it's, it's great to have Sarah here as well, because they have a, a relationship with Rise. Um, but you've got people like Newable, um, British Private Equity Club, um, Cambridge Angels, various people out there in the marketplace investing in early stage med tech um, as angels. Um, but I think, you know, going back to the angel thing, often it, it, it will be perhaps someone's got some experience, they've got a particular reason or a passion to be investing in med tech or your particular subcategory of med tech. Um, venture capital, um, I think, uh, oh, too quick, venture capital is a bit of a different um, kettle of fish, quite simply because, um, you know, when we talk about venture capital, these people aren't investing their own money typically. They're investing high net worth, they're investing institutional cash. So they are in a position where they need to deploy and they run under pressure to invest in a particular time frame. So if you're looking at venture capital, think about what time frame they're at, where they are at that point in their fund cycle. That's really important to them. Um, and there's quite a number of specialist funds out there in medtech uh, nowadays, uh, or, or generally life sciences, healthcare. Um, but I think more and more you're getting agnostic funds who are, are investing in this in this arena. Um, and I, I suppose the thing, thing to think about with venture capitalists is they are spreading risk. So they have a portfolio, they, they invest in say 10 companies and they want to um, spread that risk and, and ensure that um, you know, maybe a couple of those companies will be fine, they'll be okay, they might make small returns. Um, there'll be a couple of companies that might fall by the wayside and then you've got maybe one or two better returns. So that comes back to the idea around, um, you know, venture capitalists, they look for say a 10 times return over five to seven years and that's important to them. So, you know, again, important to think about what model. Um, and, and finally, to, to the last icon on the page, um, family offices, corporate VCs, different different scenarios here. Um, family offices uh, often have that, you know, what, what's 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 the impact for the family? What's what's the longer term view? Um, they they might have a particular preference that could be driven by by personal experience, etc. They're likely to be more patient because they can be. Um, but 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 a different approach in, in their investment thesis. And similarly with corporate venture capital, um, quite a lot of activity in the corporate venture capital med tech arena. And, and when you think about corporate venture capital, well, it could be very aligned with the technical needs of the company or what the future company is going to look like. That, however, could rise, bring rise to exclusivity agreements there where, where you're not able to work with other companies, but can be a fantastic way for you to access someone who, who potentially that you could exit to um, longer term and also that might not be driving the same return times as as your venture capitalist and um, so so again just just things that you might want to consider um, and, and going back to that you know who are these actual people <laughs> you know under the under the models under the banners um, mostly um, they are men of a certain age um, to, to be fair, I mean, if you look at the stats here, um, so it's 85% are over 45 um, and, and the majority are male. The majority are also based in the south um, of, of England. Um, I think realistically that that is a typical demographic across um, your, your VC, your family office, your corporate venture as well. Um, is that changing? I think so, um, solely. Um, but, but, but I think, you know, in terms of those individuals, well, they are often from financial services backgrounds, they're accountants, um, so they might have a very shrewd eye for numbers, 
um, good attention to detail. Um, and, and often they will have exited a successful business, um, which, which will give them that level of experience um, that, that you know, could be invaluable to you in your business. Um, you know, as, as a medtech investor, you know, I think understanding when you go to speak to investors, understanding what, what is their background? Are they very good at your area or actually will they have blind spots? Help them with that narrative because, um, you know, a lot of investors will have done a lot of analysis into the area before they even come speak to you. But that's not to say that they know everything um, and getting the right tone. Uh, and the right sort of um, um, level of knowledge is important because I think what happens a lot of the time is you get individuals who sort of assume knowledge um, and then also um, people who, uh, you know, just don't paint the picture properly. Um, they, 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 they might not provide the, the depth of knowledge or bring the story out as well as they could do to help them with that proposition. So just, just being aware of these things. I think in terms of, of these sort of stats and, and that position, um, you know, that there are also regional funds. There's a lot of British business bank investment going into different areas in the country to help with that leveling up agenda and provide access to capital. But one of the things that I think may be positive out of COVID, everybody's doing the meetings over Zoom. So hopefully we can be a bit more joined up as the UK as an ecosystem. Um, just sort of just generally looking at some of the medtech trends, um, I you know, mentioned it that I think really we're seeing more funds who who you know wouldn't necessarily have done more. They may be doing more medtech. I think COVID will probably also support that as well and help that. So so quite a variety of funds that are out there. Um, I've included just below um, some of the medtech specific funds. These are global funds, however, um, and and actually that's from 2018. So the, the there's probably a little bit of shift there. Um, but if you think about the UK, um, you know, Sequoia, Living Bridge, um, Ampersand, SV Health, um, UK specific earlier stage, people like Deep Bridge, Albion, um, Cambridge um, um, Innovation Capital, Avingworth, all quite active in med tech, but that might not make up the full spread of their portfolio. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of patents have been filed in the last sort of five years, and that's starting to show. I was speaking to an investor uh, last week, and um, one of the things that she said, which I thought was quite useful to sort of articulate this, was that about the blurring of lines, and that this is a long-term view that the investors expect to see. The, the blurring of lines between the, the commercial, the, what was consumer, the, the healthcare market, and the technical market, we expect to see that continuing. Um, so, you know, we're seeing med tech today, but that, that, that's going to be a broader um, broader um, uh, sector, I think, going forward. Also on the on the screen, um, there is a, um, a, a, a little bit about the corporate venturing activity in the area. So again, corporate venturing in the last 10 years has really picked up much more happening um, and more companies considering having corporate venturing arms. Um, so people like Philips, Abbott, Roche, SR1 have life sciences, uh, medical devices, um, corporate venturing abilities. And that could be one, one of the, you know, a way that could, yeah, as I said, lead towards an exit, towards sales for you to receive investment. Um, I couldn't have gone on this and not talked about COVID. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's very dull. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that did happen with the investment sort of side of things recently is that while well, everybody sort of took took stock, they, they battened down the hatches a bit and they looked at their, their portfolios. That said, when I'm out there speaking to investors at the moment, a lot of them have said, well, actually, there was some really good stuff that happened for some of our portfolio companies and we still did deals. And I think there's going to be a flurry of activity now before end of the year into next year because of tax incentives too. But certainly that continuation, a lot of capital that still needs to be deployed. So it's, it's a fairly positive view, actually, I, I would say, of, of what's coming, coming back from other investors in this area. Um, I think, um, you know, clearly, as I said, some opportunities, um, a lot about the IVD testing gold rush, but also the fact that that um, drove up prices, so, so made it very competitive. Um, and, um, and, you know, there's a lot of positive response from investors about the, the um, non-dilutive cast injections, but at the same time, you had some of their portfolio who really struggled because of supply chain, because of some of the challenges around COVID. Um, on the right, I've, I've put some pointers here about things that 
you know people are saying in the, in the investor marketplace about things they're expecting to see and, and what's going to become more popular I think actually the sharper focus points, the differentiator, the regulatory environment, the supply chain, that stuff has always been important. But again, just because of COVID, some of these things have become that extra bit important. Um, and, and actually all of this is, is pretty standard stuff. We, you know, when we're looking at propositions, we expect to see a holistic view. And, and, and these, these aspects are all, all equally important. But at the same time, you know, I think, you know, as the as the market gets more competitive, these are the things you need to focus on. We want to be seeing these things. I've just drawn out a couple of um, a couple of uh, sort of aspects of this that when we're looking at investments and and the companies coming through that I sometimes think could be done better and actually are really important. So market sizing and that return on investment. Remember, what is your investor looking for? Is it a 10 times return? Is it actually that they're more patient and they're not terribly fussed about that? Are they going to invest again? Think about these things because that also translates to how you um, articulate your market sizing. Um, typically, you will see something uh, you know, like the, the, the image on the screen about the market size. And, and one of my bugbears is that often you see companies who are or either exceptionally um, uh, ambitious or equally under ambitious. Do your top down, your bottom up, think about the growth, think about regulatory changes, um, be realistic and appropriate and remember what is your investor looking for. Um, and actually on that one, I recently been mentoring a prosthetics company who, fantastic company, but really struggled because again, you know, they're going to clinics, they're going to the NHS trust, they're going to charities, then they've got um, B2B sales. It gets quite complicated. And how do you, how do you discuss those channels? Um, again, um, you know, traction, always really important to an investor. Um, so do you actually have sales? Have you got customers? Can you show it? And, and how are you driving that momentum? I always think um, traction is fantastic in the sense that, you know, we talk about traction all the time, but what does it really mean? means the opposite of distraction. Are you focused? Are you moving forward? Um, with med tech companies, again, the clinical regulatory pathway, that needs to be clear. You need to be showing that you're credible, you understand it, and you've got a plan for it. And that is important when going to an investor. Certainly one is in the healthcare environment who could be very astute, very aware of what they're looking for. But also, you know, if you're looking at agnostic investors as well, they'll be aware of the risks of negotiating the NHS pathways, et cetera. Um, really, really important um, team, I think, is often underestimated and how important this is. Um, and I tru do truly believe in that cliche that, you know, an A, an a star team with a B star idea is better than your, your, a, your a star um, idea. Um, you know, end user markets, your team needs to understand how to navigate those end user markets. We would probably expect to see um, clinical experience or, or operational experience, market experience in, in a med tech um, company. And that would give, give, give you know, reassurance that you know how to do this. Um, it doesn't have to be a complete train. Um, you, you can have advisors. And, and also I think, depending on where you're raising at, Again, you, you're not expected to have the complete set of people there, but um, very important. Um, kind of winding that back, because um, I'm conscious of time, I'm probably overrun already. Um, just thinking of, um, you know, your audience. Who are these people behind, you know, these, 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 you know, you're going to these VCs. Who are these actual people? What do they do? Day to day, that's what they do. You know, they're really busy. They're busy looking after their portfolio companies. They're you know, raising their own fund if they're a VC, they're going to the high net worth, to the institutionals, that's quite time consuming, as you'll know when you start raising your own um, investment. They're looking at hundreds of, of pitch events, uh, pitch decks, and they've got office hours, etc. Make it as easy as possible because people are time poor. So for you to get the best opportunity, how you, you know, how your, how your proposition is, is laid out before them is going to be really important. So there is a bit of tick box activity there of, you know, what do they expect to see? How can I make that better? How can I refine it? What reaction do I get from them? That's important. And again, dependent on the different investors you're going to, think about, you know, what's the risk appetite? What are their investment horizons? Do they have other similar technologies in their portfolio? That's really important. Um, and what's their thesis? And do you fit with that? Because if you don't, don't waste your time because you'll kiss an awful lot of frogs and you'd be much smarter to you know have a polished proposition go out to people 
um, with the right stuff and, and, and go to less for, for your fundraise because it's a time consuming activity. Um, so again, just preparation, very important iteration, get your story right, um, run it through with a number of people um, and, and be very targeted in what you do. There's lots of people out there um, who can help you with that, um, which makes a big difference. I think I'm being told that I, I'm running out of time. Um, I, uh, um, just to sort of end on, 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 on a sort of good note, um, you know, fundraising is hard. Um, I think though, relatively, there's some positive activity going on in the med tech um, environment from an investment opportunity, but it's getting competitive. So be very aware of that. So think back to the differentiator. You know, have you got your regulatory stuff sorted? Have you got your supply chain sorted? And do you know your channel to market and how you're gonna do it? And that does take time to work through, but those things are really important. Um, I think also, you know, going, this, this is about you and what works for your company. So the team, very, very important. How you present that proposition with that team, great. And, and if you find the right investors, you know, no reason that, that you shouldn't be successful. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully uh, that has provided some insight. Thank you very much, Mari, um, for that. Hopefully, as you say, that's provided some, some useful pointers to, to everyone. So I'd like to invite um, the whole of the panel um, to have a Q&A session now, please. Um, so perhaps if we could um, start our cameras and what I'll do is I'll, I'll just run through a few of the, the questions that have that have come up. Um, so Sarah, the, the first one uh, is, is for, for you. Um, you talked about um, Digital London um, today. Um, do the other academic health science networks in the UK have a digital focus? Uh, so if, if one of our attendees is, is not London based, how, you know, where would they uh, have a point to call? Absolutely. Well, you can still come to us, even though it's called digitalhealth.london, we do actually have national um, companies. Um, so although we were primarily set up for London, we do support other areas. Um, however, there is also Manchester um, has a, um, a digital side of things. It's not the same offering as ours, but certainly is, is, is an offering, um, as is Eastern Region have a, an offering for digital health. Um, so uh, both of those areas um, will have support. And can you tell us when the next recruitment is for your accelerator program? I'm not sure I picked that up. Yeah, not a problem at all. We normally go out about June to July. It's quite a long process because we go through quite a robust process to get people. So you would be starting to, uh, the applications would go in in June, July. We would be interviewing you in September for a November start next year. Okay, so people have got plenty of time to, to get themselves on the yeah. go. And so would they join the launch pad? The opportunities are still open for Launchpad now, is that right? Launchpad um, is a couple of times a year. It's um, on the website when it will be open next. We're just reviewing because we think we might squeeze another one in at the beginning of next year. So we'll, we're seeing what we can do to try and support that. But certainly, even though it's um, next year that you're talking about, if you wish to speak to us in the meantime, or you want to go through to uh, one of the um, innovation exchange teams, then um, that, that's not a problem at all. We can arrange for a, an informal meeting where you just chat and see where you fit and which is most likely. And you mentioned a very successful webinar series that you recently hosted. That could be of, definitely be of interest to a number of people. Um, is the recordings of that available or where do we, where do we find that information? Uh, they have done the recordings. They're just the webinar series only finished last week, so they're just pulling okay. everything together. So they may be available via the website shortly. Um, otherwise, they're actually also organising some more. Um, the academic centres um, have said that they want to support some more of these, so there will be some more opportunities available. Okay, that's great, um, Michael. I had a, a question for you for yourself. Um, so you, you mentioned um, some UK funding programs and also some international partnership programs. Mm -hmm. So, why would what would you recommend for a typical UK small med tech company? You know, should they get involved first in one of the UK programs, and and you know how might they get involved in working with a company in South Korea? That seems a tough ask at first at first sight. Um, so firstly, uh, you know, we, we've heard about, you know, some different support mechanisms. And in terms of the cash, it's it just from a cash perspective, it's about, you know, what the right money for them is. And, and as uh, Myri pointed out, it's, it's about, 
you know, non-dilutive funding is, is one option. It can be quite interesting for, especially for earlier stage companies, but, you know, they might want expertise down the line as well. So it's, it's really thinking about what, what stage they're at and what sort of money they, they're, they're at. But um, in, in terms of navigating the opportunities, I always suggest they have a look at the Knowledge Transfer Network website that contains all of the opportunities that we have, not just with Innovate UK, but other funding organisations as well. Um, NIHR have some, some good funding um, uh, initiatives as well, through the, like their I4I programme, for instance. So, 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 you know, there are opportunities out there, but trying to keep track of, of what's out there can be, can be quite difficult. So I always signpost people to the KTN website. In terms, of the, in terms of the overseas stuff, again, you know, it, if you really want to be working with South Korea or the US, well, you know, it's why are you wanting to do that? It's, it has to be driven by, you know, not just by kind of an interest and, you know, this, this seems quite, quite a nice thing to do. It's, you know, fundamentally, you know, if, if the US is your target market or if South Korea is your target market and, you, you know, your regulatory plan, your business plan supports that, then um then come and have a chat to us you know and, and there are kind of regularly opportunities but you know you have to be invested as a as an individual and as a company to, to to really get the most out of these opportunities and can people approach um their local ktn contact um michael or do they come directly to innovate uk i i again i always suggest they have a chat to ktn because they they have um, access and awareness of lots of opportunities whereas if you come to talk to me I'll, I'll bore you about regulation and about biomedical catalyst but you know I, I kind of no, I'm slightly blinkered in my view of the world. Right um Mari I think I have a, a question for for you to come through now um do you see an appetite um for digital health from investors um given it's a new technology area and the market isn't very well developed so you might have problem answering the traction question yeah, I, mean, I absolutely do. Um, I, I think, um, so I, I primarily work on the, the hard tech component of the digital health side of things, but um, record year last two years, I think in, in the US and, and certainly I think it's been, been very active in the UK. Um, yes, it's, I mean, investors are looking for emerging markets and there now are some, some good success stories to follow on from. So I think that's that's pretty encouraging. And, and also, again, given COVID, I suspect you'll, you'll just see a flurry of activity in that market um, in, in the next six months to a year. Um, the, in terms of the traction piece, um, traction is relative <laughs> um, and, and relative to your stage and, and you know, what the investor is looking to see um, for your business, again, you know, they'll be looking at who else is operating, who else is making investments, but, you know, that are similar to you to, to, to benchmark against. Um, so, so certainly you knowing what competitors and people who've come before and, and learning from them. Um, so you can be very clear about how you're going to move forward it is important there. I'll and you mentioned question. you mentioned an interesting term called sweat equity. A few people might be wondering what a sweat equity is. So maybe you could just Sorry, explain Sorry, I probably that one. jumped over it. Um, uh, so sweat equity is um, instead of cash for, for equity, so selling um, selling part of your business for, 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 for equity, um, you would be um, providing equity to an investor um, in return for access to facilities and, and in-kind resources, essentially. So for example, um, with CPI Enterprises, um, with some of the investments we're looking at at the moment, um, we would take a share um, of the company in return for them coming in and working with our team um, at, at, at our facilities. And maybe I can pass this um, sort of similar questions over to, to Sarah. Um, so how do you work with the companies in your program um, for when they seek investment? Obviously, you're giving them so many hours of support, either 12 hours or 100 hours of support through the program. But how do you work with public and private investors um, with those companies? I'd say that if you are looking for mainly investment, we're probably not the program for you. Ours is much more about the development over the whole year. However, we do have that relationship, as uh, Mari said, um, with RISE and with MedCity. And MedCity support us um, with the investment conversations that our companies will have. Um, so it's there is investment to an extent 
but it's not the priority of our particular um, accelerator. There are other accelerators, but that's partly because we don't take any investment. We don't take any equity. This is purely um, a um, uh, subsidized by the European Union um, and through the um, state aid. So that's why it's not really our main area. Our skills are within the NHS and knowing and understanding the NHS. Um. Thank you very much. And Michael, I think um, a lot of people will be interested. You have a great insight into what's coming in the future in the way of support. Um, so can we expect to see UK government putting more support behind the digital and connected healthcare agenda um, in the near future? Can you give us any insight into the direction of travel in that area? Um... Uh, well, it's such a big agenda and covers so many, <laughs> covers so many bases. I mean, the, the, you know, fundamentally, when we look at healthcare provision, we're, you know, we're looking at the NHS is, is constantly having to provide more with the same or less funding. Um, hospitals, very expensive resources, um, and we want to obviously move to prevention or, or early detection. Um, and digital will play a key role in that in terms of being able to, you know, do the prevention, early detection, but also treatment outside of, of conventional um, healthcare um, sort of facilities. Um, but also from a personal perspective, you know, there's also the, the, the whole sort of biohacking and personal responsibility for, for our own health as well and, and health data. And um, I, I think there'll be an interesting, well, there will be interesting dis discussions, both from an ethical perspective and a practical perspective around how our data is used, who owns our data, how do we use it? How can we use it to develop safer products like register, you know, how can we use it to, to create registries, for instance, or um it, so so it's definitely the, the direction of travel um you know going beyond um sort of where we are right at the moment we're also seeing things like human augmentation and cognitive enhancements so elon musk's company in the us you know they've got this this um device that you can implant into your brain and you'll be able to hook it up to google and you know all this all this sort of stuff so the the you know the direction of travel is is very digitally um, digitally focused so so we're just going to see more emphasis but you know adoption is is always challenging um, and and you know certainly for my my time in industry um, it, it, the adoption piece is, is very much linked to, to developing the right cultures as well within the healthcare delivery organization and bringing the people along um, but also getting the right sort of reimbursement and, and financial incentives right. So having the right, the, I mean, this and this is why we need the AHSNs um, and, and why they you know, provide great value in this space, because they help um, understand those, those challenges and help try and address them. And Sarah, so we had a, um, a, a question in one of the earlier sessions, which was about um, the NHS internal pull and demand for digitally enabled technologies. Um, from your perspective, do you are you seeing a strong pull, you know, from from you know people within the day-to-day -day healthcare, you know, frontline and, and an environment for for these new technologies, or is it a, still a technology push area? Um. I have seen a massive step change in the last couple of years. That doesn't mean that every nurse on the ward actually knows exactly and is happy to take on new innovation. It means that the staff are starting to understand and see the benefits. Don't forget a lot of the staff actually have had years of having technology thrown at them and they haven't really known what to do or how to do things. So it's going to take a long time. But what I am really seeing is a lot of leaders coming through who are really championing championing why this needs to happen and i'm seeing that both through the nhsx work but also through lots of colleagues that i've worked with um, on the digital academy um, these are 200 and odd staff now who are out and about in the nhs who are, have been trained and fully believe that this is the way we need to go and why we need to do it so there's an awful lot there is a step change i'm really pleased is that actually um, things are starting to go that way. I thought it was going to probably take another six, five or six years before it actually started making a difference. COVID has changed that. It has ex extremely quickly meant that staff are um, having to respond to delivering digital transformation. But there is some leadership there. So the, bear with us, but it is coming. I definitely believe in it. 
and and so you think it, it it's really that uh, that benefit that people are seeing in their day to day um, delivery of service, which is bringing it through. And, it, and it's not it, it's not been a regulatory. You know, obviously the regulations are changing uh, rapidly at the same time. So you know, connected medical devices, you know, and post market surveillance are very important topics on the regulatory field. So you you feel it's 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 not just the regulations that pushing it in that direction. It absolutely isn't. I think we're getting better. Um, uh, better innovations. I think that it's um, people are starting to see in little areas with little innovations coming through. Oh, that can make a real difference to my patient's outcomes, or that I can understand the data around why my patients are behaving this way and what's happening. And I think that it's those things that are making a big difference. But as I say, so a mixture of a bit of regulation and then steering as to where we're going, um, the clinical leadership side of things, and then innovators learning to work really well with the NHS and understanding the culture and the NHS understanding the culture of innovators will make the difference. Okay, that's great. Um, so I'm just looking, I don't think uh, we've got any questions which I uh, haven't um, discussed at the moment. I'm going to give my uh, opportunity to Kevin. Kevin, would you, do you have any more questions for our panelists today or any comments? Hi, oh, there Hello, he is. Tom. Yeah, I got there eventually. Uh, no questions for the panelists, just to thank them uh, for committing the time to this uh, session. Um, happy to do a quick summary, if you like, for the for the webinar series. That'd be great, thank you. Yeah, I mean, for, for, for me over the last, uh, well, it's been two days, there's been five webinars and 15 speakers. The, the three simple take-home messages for me is one we heard in the first webinar from the NHS, uh, that the NHS absolutely uh, is looking for and adopting uh, digitized medical devices. The demand is increasing. And I say the NHS, but it's not just the NHS, it's healthcare delivery organizations across the world. And, and obviously digitized devices improve patient outcomes, but also for the companies that, that uh, develop and supply these devices, that drives sales and drives profitability. So, so there is a real drive in terms of the need first take home message, second take home message, the challenges are absolutely real, whether that's security and information governance, whether it's regulation or technical know-how, it is a phenomenally technical space, but those challenges are not insurmountable. Uh, and the third take home message perhaps is to why they're not insurmountable. Clearly we're seeing uh, products entering the market. Uh, and the reason why that's not insurmountable for companies is that as we've heard from so many speakers over the course, course of this uh, webinar series, uh, they, they, sorry, I was distracted there. Um, the, the reason why uh, they these things haven't, <laughs> sorry, I've got emails coming through, clicking on my screen. Um, yeah, so, so the third take home message, we've had so many speakers throughout the series that can tell us that they can handle companies. Um, and that's the important thing, that there are people out there that do have the expertise uh, that can handle companies to get where they need to be. And I think that really uh, moves us on to today. There's also support out there, there's funding support, there's support from the public sector. Uh, and as um, Maria has indicated, there's support in terms of private and public sector um, investment. So that's all I have to say. I would, one, I've already thanked the speakers. Two, I'd also like to thank um, Jojo and Sarah from CPI uh, and Emma from Medlink for all the hard work that they put in to pull in this webinar series together. Sorry for that interruption. I had some emails popping up that were urgent. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, there will be a holding slide at the end, um, which will give you some for more contact details if you if you want to want to follow up on this, and uh, you'll look forward to receiving the the recordings of, of the webinar as follow up. So thank you very much again to everyone, and have a have a great day. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you.